It's live. It's live. Hey, everybody. My name is James. I'm with King's Fine Woodworking. And Nick Ferry is here with us today. Everybody probably knows Nick uh, from his uh, YouTube channel there. We, uh, I put a link, a link to uh, Nick's page in the description. And uh, I was going to talk today a little bit about exotics, different uh, exotic wood species. So I wonder if I should, uh, we should chat for a couple minutes and see if a few more people pop on. Yeah, I, I like that. I take, sometimes, you know, because I think it sends a notification to all your subscribers. and Okay. So, yeah, it takes a few minutes to get people to get on. Okay, good. Let's do that. So how about, how about you, Nick? Are you, what, what, what current projects are you working on right now? Uh, too, too many is a short answer. Um, a couple benches, uh, a couple picture frames, um, uh, a jig for my table saw sled, um, what else? Oh, a, pu a push block, a, like a fancy one. So yeah, I got I got quite a few going right now. Awesome. Uh, we're currently we're working on a uh, queen size sleigh bed made of oak, and uh, and mallets. We've got a lot of mallet orders uh, that we got to produce, and uh, that that's kind of what we're working on right now. It it for a second I thought I was following along, and you said uh, an oak uh, sleigh bed. Or a sleigh bed made from oak and mallets, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd probably be that probably be something I would try. Oak, <laughs> oak and mallets. Mallets for the legs. Yeah, mallets for the legs. I don't know. Huh? No, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm working on a lap desk uh, for my wife as well. Oh yeah, that's right. That was out of what? Bird's eye maple. You. Yeah, it's a uh, bird's eye maple, and it's got some ebony and uh, cocobolo or cocobolo inlay in that. So somebody's saying hi to you there, Nick. Who's long, long live Paduk. It looks like Steve Osborne says hi, Nick. Oh, I, I totally missed that. I, and, I, and, and I'm like, I'm trying to keep up here. Oh, it was right after I said hi. Okay. Yeah, right after you said hi. Okay. All right, so we're going to wait just one or two more minutes before I start talking about some of these different species of, uh, of exotics. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask? Uh, Jason says sync is off, but I don't care if you don't. Um, uh oh, Jason, the audio and video is a little bit off. Yeah, Jason, what's off exactly? You're talking to two perfectionists, so. <laughs> <laughs> We have a question from Cy. <laughs> Cy, what did you ask, Cy? Oh, what's yeah? What's everybody's favorite species of wood? Well, I, I have a favorite. My favorite is cocobolo or cocobolo. I guess depends on who you are or where you're from. This is a, a mallet that I made um, out of a piece of cocobolo I've been saving for about 25, 26 years, something like that. And I finally broke down and cut it and turned it into a mallet. Not sure why I was saving it, but uh, it's my favorite species of wood. You have a you have a favorite species there, Nick. I would say uh, uh, maple is what I use the most, and I know we're talking exotics. I understand maple is not exotic, but sure. uh, either that or walnut. You know what? I should have I should have grabbed. I didn't. The only reason I didn't grab a chunk of walnut is because we weren't necessarily. But yeah, so I'll, I'll have it for show and tell later. Good. <laughs> I have. Let's see here. It's two, three, four, five. Five exotic species. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. We probably have some doubles, though. Okay. Yeah. Someone asked if uh, uh, Paduk was food safe. So Paduk is food safe, actually. Um, there are a few exotics that are not, but uh, if you made a bowl with Paduk and kept fruit in it or even potato chips, something like that, would be okay. You'd need to have a finish probably on the Paduk anyway, some sort of an oil-based finish. But, uh, but yeah, Paduk itself, the, the, uh, the chemical compounds in that are not toxic to consume. One thing, uh, speaking of toxicity, um, walnut shavings are bad for a few animals, especially uh, horses or any type of equestrian type bedding. So, um, if if you if you're you know using your stuff as animal bedding, do not use walnut. Yeah, I've heard a few stories about walnut. Some people uh, using the sawdust shavings as uh, uh, they can put it on their weeds potentially and kill those in their yard. Um, we tried it without good success, but I have, I've heard people use that. So. Yeah, I just actually learned that not too long ago, just a couple months ago, because my, my friend uh, Bob, who's also a woodworker, also has horses, and he's got like a special 
you know, he, he rehooks his machines anytime he's working with walnut just to make sure it doesn't go in his. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, we actually, we, we give wood to uh, uh, like the Dumb Friends League, a local uh, animal shelter, a place that takes care of animals. Uh, our, our shavings we give to them, but we always make sure it's clean. And, uh, and it's typically just oak or maple that we give them. We make sure walnut's not in that as well, just in case. So someone wants to know what oil do we use for food safe projects? So personally, I use uh, food grade mineral oil and you can use beeswax with that as well if you want to. That's a pretty good combination for cutting boards. I imagine there are others out there, maybe walnut oil. I'm not sure what all, what all is available, but uh, mineral oil is, uh, is very, very popular. Will walnut oil keep on as far as a finish um, or is that gonna go rancid? You know, I don't know. I just I, I see I've seen in forums that people talk about putting that on their cutting boards or on salad bowls in particular. So yeah, so, since it's an organic oil in the sense that it comes from from a food product, I'm not sure that that's something we I should I should probably have researched, but I don't know. Mineral oil will not. Um, it's uh, it it doesn't come from a food product, so it will never go rancid. I. I'm of a weird camp. I mean, if you want like a food, food safe oil, I always say mineral oil, but I have no problem putting like shellac, lacquer, polyurethane on my stuff. As long as it's not a cutting board to where you're going to be cutting up a film finish into chips. Right. Um, but I mean, and people are, Oh, is that food safe? Is that food safe? I I'm pretty sure. And you would know way more about this, James, but I'm pretty much anything that fully cures out is safe for contact of food. Right. Yeah. In fact, that's right. Uh, almost all finishes that are polymers, like lacquer, polyurethane, things like that, uh, once they're cured, whatever solvent was in them is gone, and the only thing that's left is the is essentially a, pl a plastic compound, which is inert. So even if you were to chop up uh, dried shellac and eat it, it wouldn't cause you any harm. So Stephen Irvin uh, says audio is lagging by one or two seconds. I don't. I'm not really sure what to do. Do you have any ideas on that, Nick? Uh, aside from like muting yourself and then unmuting or hopping out of the room and hopping back in real quick, but is anybody is, is everybody's audio lagging? Steven, is everybody's audio lagging or is it just mine? I think as somebody earlier said it mine as mine is as well. Okay, so should I hop, maybe I'll hop out and hop back in? How's that? Okay, just be quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So while yeah, while he fixes that, we, yeah, we want to make sure it's you know, at least so that it's not like an old, um, what do you want to call it? Uh, one of those old kung fu movies like we go for pizza. <laughs> but now that I was lagging, it it probably was 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 spot on on that one. So there you go. Like like it's like watching a Godzilla movie. That's exactly it. So as soon as he hops back in, as soon as James hops back in, then I'll hop out and hopefully that fixes it. Um, cause I, yeah, I saw that it was both of ours, but so anyways, hopefully he's, he's coming back. <laughs> I can try and write down any questions you guys might have for James in the meantime, but normally it's just a quick click out, click back in, hang up and dial again, that type of thing. But yep, I know I'm, I'm lagging too. Uh, if we both hop out, that'll kill the live feed. So as soon as James hops back in, hopefully that fixes it for him. And then I can hop out, hop back in. Jason said, it wasn't really a big deal. I, I, I know. I, you know, but we, we both are kind of like that. But let me, uh, let me send him a link and make sure he comes back in. Hopefully he didn't go to reboot his whole computer. Oh, there he goes. He's back. I'm back. I hope that, uh, that it seemed to take a really long time for me to get out and get back in. Uh, well, here, I'll, I'll hop out and hopefully it fixes mine then. Okay. <laughs> try, 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 uh, try speaking before moving our mouth like we're in a kung fu movie. That might be the way to do it. So am I still lagging? Am I, can anybody tell me if I'm still lagging? I hope I'm not. No luck. Darn it. Oh, hey. that's, not, that's not good. No luck. Not better. Some people were saying it's not the end of the world, though. Okay, well, that sucks, unfortunately. We'll have to research it for next time. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. All right, looks like there's a hundred something people on right now, so I was going to go ahead and start. Um, what what uh, I want to talk about today were some exotics. So I, I'm a really big fan 
uh, of exotic wood. I've used a lot of exotics in my life. I've been woodworking for a long time, uh, um, about 30 years, and uh, and probably three quarters of my projects involve exotic wood. So I was going to give a quick rundown of some different species of wood. And um, <clears throat> a wood that's very common that I like to use is African paduk. Let me take a look here. I got a piece of... Uh, paduk. So I'm going to hold up some of these species of wood. This African paduk, it, uh, it's, a, it's a really bright uh, orange colored wood. This has a kind of a unique looking grain pattern to it. Uh, it's a wood that's found in Africa. Um, so some of the things you have to worry about some of these woods is African paduk is a sensitizer, um, which means if, you, if you're using the wood and you use it all the time, you can develop a sensitivity to it, which means it can cause you an allergic reaction. Um, it's used a lot for musical instruments and it's used for keepsake boxes and things like that. This is a keepsake box that I made uh, from African Paduk. It's, uh, oh, there's the open side there, but um, it's really good for projects like this. A lot of exotics are, because of the cost of some of the exotics, they're really more suited for small projects or musical instruments, things like that. Um, let's see, what's another good wood to use? Real quick, uh, Jennifer yes. Robinson wants to know where do you get your exotic woods? Okay, so I get my exotic woods from my local hardwood dealer. I'm in uh, the Denver, Colorado area, and there's a couple of them here. If, if anybody's listening who's in the Denver, Colorado area, we buy from Paxton Hardwoods, and I buy from Austin Hardwoods. That's two, two common places here. There are a number of places online where you can buy exotics as well. Yeah, so hopefully if you don't have a hardwood dealer in your, in your town, you can. Some of the places online are like Belforce Products or Hearn Hardwoods. I don't have links to those in my description. You can Google them. I'll add them to the description later. I'm not specifically recommending these places because I've never bought from them, but I see they advertise uh, pretty heavily. Uh, so if you buy Paduk, you should probably be looking at somewhere in the $11 a board foot range. And now it's probably a good time to mention I have created a sheet, a spreadsheet, if anybody's interested. And it's in a downloadable format, and it kind of highlights all of these different species of wood. It talks about different uh, different things about the wood, how big the tree is, where the trees grow, um, how many species uh, are represented by the tree, uh, the density of the wood. Some of these woods are so dense they'll actually sink in water. Uh, the hardness of the wood, the Jenka hardness. Uh, Jenka hardness is an interesting thing. It's a measure of how many pounds of force it takes to depress a steel ball bearing into the wood a certain distance. Um, the uh, elast elastic modulus, which is really a measure of board bending strength. How much can you bend the board before it breaks? And in this spreadsheet, I have put red oak kind of as a, a reference uh, piece. And so you can see how the strengths and hardness of some of these exotics and the price, in fact, uh, compares to a common wood that you might purchase like red oak. So that's free for download. There's a link to that in the description if anybody's interested. Nick, you'll have to jump in and interrupt me if I'm missing anything or if you have some input. Uh, well, no, I just added in the outside that Cookwoods um, is another online source. Oh, great. Okay, great. So I, I think it's cookwoods.com or cookhardwoods.com if you Google it. So you, And you had mentioned Bell Forest. Um, so there's, there's definitely places to get it online. Uh, but another reason, I mean, you said for smaller projects, musical instruments, stuff like that, uh, yeah, just based on the cost. Right, uh, right, based on the cost. And in fact, not even necessarily just the cost, but if you take a wood like uh, marble wood uh, or some of these other species of wood like zebra wood, these things, these pieces of wood are so highly figured, if you had a large product, project like a cabinet or a dining table, it's going to look really busy with, with really uh, grain that has a very intensive pattern uh, over the, the the expanse of a giant tabletop might not look might not look very good. The, something like this might be better left for an accent piece as opposed to the entire field of the table. Uh, someone else mentioned eBay or Amazon. That's a that's a good spot. Okay, yeah. So on this download sheet, I have all of that listed, and I have what's a fair board foot price for all of this wood. And you can positively get all of this wood for less than this board foot price that I've put here, uh, but you can also pay a lot more. So you, you might want to shop around a little bit uh, for wood like that. Um, let's see. Let me talk about. Let me talk about my favorite wood, or my favorite one of my favorite exotics. It's not my can favorite, I, of course. Can I interrupt for two seconds? Did we yes. even define what's an exotic? 
Oh, sure. Okay, yeah. So basically, I, an exotic, as I'm defining it, are woods that are imported into the United States, woods that don't grow um, in the United States typically. Uh, so, you know, if you if, here, of course, our, our common species that we will have would be cherry, maple, oak, uh, walnut, uh, pine, and uh, the, any species that, that are found domestically in the, in the continental U.S. and Canada, those are, you know, considered domestics. And then exotics are woods that are typically imported. So, um, all right. So the one wood that I, I like, I enjoy a lot is uh, lignum, lignum vitae. So this is, a, this is a very hard wood, reasonably hard wood. It's a very, very dense wood. I make a lot of mallets, for example, out of it because the mallet heads are very heavy. And um, it's just, it's great. And it's really, really hard. So it'll take a lot of impact without, without taking much damage. Some of the some of the specs on on lignum lignum comes from Central and South America, a lot of woods come from there actually. Uh, so from Central and South America, so it has a it has a density of 1.26 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, you can also say specific gravity. Uh, density is a measure of how tightly uh, you know the molecules in a substance are packed together, how much matter you can fit into a space. So lignum is actually the densest of all species of wood. The density of water is one, so the density of lignum is 1.26. So it will it will positively sink in water. This is a very very heavy piece, maybe two three pounds uh, uh, for this piece of wood. So lignum is uh, it's a there is a little bit of irritation can be irritation if you use lignum vitae a lot. It can cause uh, irritation on your skin. It does not for everybody, uh, but it can. Um, so. Also, lignum vitae is hard to get, and it's a little bit rare. So in my spreadsheet, I've talked about uh, the conservation status of some of these species of woods. Uh, there are two main organizations that deal with conservation status, and that's CITES, C-I-T-E-S. That's the Convention on International Trade for Endangered Species. And the other is the IUCN. The IUCN is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And they create lists and they put on their lists woods that are threatened or endangered. And so uh, genuine lignum vitae is actually on the CITES appendix too. So that makes it a little harder to get. It's regulated a little bit more, so people can't just go in and cut whole forests of it down. And so consequently, you're gonna pay a little bit more uh, when you see stuff like that. In fact, lignum is about uh, $80 a board foot. Uh, so, okay, you interrupt me anytime for questions. Someone asked, how illegal is ebony? Ebony is not illegal at all. Ebony, in fact, many ebonies are not even on uh, the CITES appendix, appendices or uh, listed with the IUCN. For, with the IUCN, it's called the red list. Um, so it also depends on what species of ebony, of course, but uh, there, there are many types that are, are available that you can get. Um, let's see. Maybe you're thinking ivory. Oh, ivory, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Which is, isn't wood, of course, but <laughs> no, that's but. hard to change. So an interesting note is uh, uh, the members of the rosewood family, uh, which in the, it, when you name a, a particular species of wood, the scientific name, the binomial classification is genus and species. So the genus under which all rosewood trees fall is called the Dalbergia genus. And I think just last fall, um, maybe 13, 14 months ago, all members of the Rosewood family uh, were moved on to protect, into protected status. So it's harder to get. So it, transporting Rosewood from one, st one country to another um, is supposed to be documented now. And so that has unfortunately raised the price of many Rosewoods. I'm going to show you a couple of them. Uh, I'll name a couple. Uh, African Blackwood, believe it or not, is a type of Rosewood. Uh, we'll find that in a second. Tulip wood, which is this wood right here. Tulip wood is a type of rosewood. That's a very a very beautiful rosewood. That's found in Brazil. And all, all of these are in the CITES Appendix 2 and uh, on the IUCN's red list. Um, the handle to this mallet is African blackwood. Uh, African blackwood is an amazing wood if you can get it. African blackwood is the most expensive wood that um, that I've ever bought. Uh, well, I guess a long time ago, ebony was crazy expensive, but African blackwood is about $150 a board foot uh, to buy it now uh, since it's gone up. It's, uh, it turns like a dream. It's, it's unbelievable how, how wonderful it turns. It does end up being pretty much pitch black by the time you get a finish on it, so you don't see much in the way of grain pattern. That's the type of rosewood. 
So this one, I don't, I don't have the grain pattern very well to show you. This is a block of East Indian rosewood, which is a very beautiful wood when it's turned. Um, another wood is called, another uh, rosewood uh, type of wood is called kingwood. Kingwood is a very dark, also a very pretty, very pretty wood. So the rosewoods actually come from all over the world. They come from Asia, Africa, uh, and South America. Here, I'll show this uh, lathe tool handle I did out of uh, East Indian rosewood. Very nice. Very and nice. I like it because the, the density, it's, it's, a, it's got a nice balance for a lathe tool. You know? Ah, right. But yeah, like you said, it's, 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 it's got some darker grain, but I mean, you, you kind of almost have to be in person to see it. Right. Beautiful stuff. Though. It is. It is beautiful stuff. Uh, one very fascinating thing about about East Indian rosewood is when you router it or cut it, the shavings from it are so soft. It's it's really unusual compared to to many species of wood. It's just very light and very fluffy. It 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 uh, it turns and, and cuts really well. I I think. So those are the, I so on my list here. I've included five of the five of the rosewoods, and they're all fairly expensive. The uh, Cocobolo and East Indian rosewood are reasonably priced. They're not. They're not too outrageous. This is a. Uh, another example of a. This handle is is cocobolo, on this mallet. This is my. This is my daily, uh, working mallet in the shop. I use this every day. It's a lignum head and, and a cocobolo handle. And it's reasonable. Cocobolo is thirty to forty dollars a foot somewhere in there. If you're paying much more than that, you're you're paying too much. Let me take a look at the questions. Is that a chili pepper sigh? Yes, let's see. All right, so this wood is, this is very interesting. This is called red zebra. It's, um, it's, it's closely related to the zebra wood family, and it's red zebra. It's, uh, it's a beautiful wood. Um, it's not very expensive. And uh, she actually, Sai made this cutting board. It's one of her early, early projects. She traced it, traced it to look like a chili. So my wife is from India, and chili peppers go in a lot of the recipes here. So she made the cutting board like a chili. It's like zebra wood but red. Like zebra wood but red, right. And Maya, my daughter online there, she loves the smell of lignum vitae. A lot of these woods have interesting interesting smells. Lignum vitae does not dull my saw blades. It's the, <laughs> the, wood, the woods that dull saw blades are, are woods that have silica typically in them. Um, if you have if you have carbide blades, they rarely dull. Um, hard, r really hard woods will rarely dull them, but if you um, if you have steel blades, then a hardwood will, will dull them a little bit easier. But there are many woods like teak that have silica in them. That silica in the sand gets drawn up into the into the uh, the fibers of the teak wood, and that's glass silica. It's very hard, and that that will dull your tools very fast. I don't know if anybody has turned with teak. Um, but that's it. Let's see. What's best for carving? Wow. I would think for carving, hand me that piece of red heart way over there. Red heart is a really beautiful wood. Let's see. This this mallet head, which is size mallet, this, her daily use in the shop is made of red heart. This is a piece of red heart that's not been, we haven't used it yet. Here's another, here's a red heart handle that it's gonna, going to go into a mallet. Red heart is, although it's a hard wood, it cuts like a dream. Um, it, it bright pink sawdust. It's it's really amazing stuff. It turns incredibly well. It takes a uh, super high polish. This has only been sanded, but it, it already has a gloss. So most of the exotics are like that. They they take a, a very high finish, a very very nice fine finish. So if you're going to carve it, maybe maybe that would that would work. Uh, Steve wants to know: Is any exotic smell like vanilla when working with it? Um, not to my knowledge, and I've worked with about 30 different species, but I've never, never smelled anything that smells like vanilla. <laughs> so, so someone said Paduk smells like some sort of meat or bacon. Hmm. That's, that, there's an interesting, uh, thing there. There is, uh, so a lot of these things, let me talk about Purple Heart real briefly. Bring me some Purple Heart. So Purple Heart is a wood that's common in Central and South America. Everybody should be, if you've seen exotics, you're probably familiar with Purple Heart. Here's a, here's a board of Purple Heart. It's actually, of course, very purple. And it's extremely popular, uh, Purple Heart is. Uh, it, they actually harvest Purple Heart in South America from more than 20 different species of wood. It's very abundant, it, the trees grow I have to look at my list. I don't have these memorized. The trees grow very big. Um, 
100 to 170 feet trunks get five feet in diameter and in South America they use these to frame houses with they'll, they'll make their two by fours out of this and frame houses this stuff is rock hard and it's a little bit difficult to work with um, but it's represented by what I was getting at it's represented by over 20 species of trees wood from any of those trees is uh, legally um, classified as purple heart and can, can be sold as such uh, one thing that you'll find in the in the trade is that a lot of people will use uh, will will get a wood that's similar, like lignum, uh, which is which is it's very hard to get genuine lignum. So people will sell a wood that they call Argentine lignum, which is not in fact lignum vitae, not as dense, but it's very similar and it looks similar. So you can get deceived sometimes. You'll still end up with a decent looking wood, but you can get deceived. But many of these. Uh, woods actually come from uh, multiple different species of trees. That's why I've only listed the genus instead of the specific species for these. Um, you mentioned purple heart. I'll show a, a bowl that I turned up. Oh, that's beautiful. So, yeah, just gorgeous. It hasn't seen much much sunlight, so it's still nice and purple. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's the key. So uh, we, we're going to talk a little bit about about keeping the color. <clears throat> for some of these woods. So if you have purple heart, everybody likes purple heart and you want to keep your purple heart purple. Oh, let me see if I can show you a picture. Can everybody see that? That's a picture of a vice that I made. It's sitting here, but if I move the camera, it, it gets really sloppy. But um, purple heart, when it's first cut from the tree, it has sort of a grayish, brownish uh, tinge uh, to it. And then after it oxidizes uh, for a little bit in the presence of the air and the presence of uh, ultraviolet light from the sun, it'll turn purple. And it'll eventually become a very bright and vivid purple. Uh, oh, somebody, I have to stop here. So Frost Light, thank you very much, just did a super chat there for, for $2. Thank you very much. Uh, so it, uh, it'll get oxidized and it'll turn bright purple. If that oxidation continues, then the oxidation will ultimately turn the wood dark brown. And most everybody who has been building with Purple Heart over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, by now all the Purple Heart stuff they have made has turned dark brown and it's no longer purple. So it's something you want to take into consideration if you want to make furniture or you want to make uh, a jewelry box or something with Purple Heart is you want to take some steps to try to keep it purple. Uh, ultraviolet light from the sun is the biggest thing that causes it to fade to brown. Um, the sun will oxidize it. Wood is made up, of, has two major components in the structure of wood. It's lignum and cellulose. Cellulose uh, does not oxidize and does not, won't change. But the lignin that's in wood will change. Uh, the lignin reacts with ultraviolet light and it turns the lignin molecules into chromophores, which change it to whatever color those types of chromophores are. In the case of purple heart, it changes it to brown. Um, so cellulose, very high grade paper, for example, is made of pure cellulose. They take wood, and they separate the cellulose from the lignin, and you have very nice bright white paper. They, they, they bleach it to make it even whiter, but they get rid of all the lignin, and it's paper that's archival quality and will last forever. Uh, cheaper papers uh, are just chopped up wood pulp, and they contain both lignin and cellulose, so not just cellulose, and those papers will fade very quickly. Newsprint is a good example of a cheap quality paper that contains a lot of lignin because it will yellow right away. It will oxidize right away. So the key to keeping your purple heart, purple heart pretty is to protect it. Number one, you want to keep it out of the sun, uh, but preferably indoors. And then number two, if you finish it with uh, a finish that has ultraviolet protection on it, like a marine grade, a spar varnish, spar urethane, something like that, then you will be able to keep the purple heart for a long time. It should stay purple for your lifetime or even longer if you, if you take care of it like that. Uh, I know I just said a whole lot there. Does anybody, uh, somebody says they love purple heart. <laughs> I just got this. And this is one of two chunks of Purple Heart I got that one of the local municipalities was tearing down benches, and it was brown and weathered. But uh, at least uh, my my friend's friend was smart enough to say, "Well, I think that's Purple Heart. What are you guys doing with that? I'll take that when you guys are done." That's awesome. That's that, that's something everybody should keep a, keep an eye out for. You know, you never know where you're going to find wood. We've talked about that in a previous chat. Oh, M. Root. Thank you very much, sir. You need uh, $20 for a super chat. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, always keep your eyes out for Purple Heart. It's uh, you never know where, or, or, or any, any wood really, you never know where you're going to find wood. Um, so, okay, what's next? Do I need to answer any questions going on here? What was that? Somebody asked about Sapili for an end grain cutting board, if that was okay. And unfortunately, I'm not familiar with Sapili and I haven't looked it up. 
I'm not sure if uh, Nick, do you know anything about that? I mean, I don't know anything as far as toxicity or anything like that, but uh, Sapili's, um, uh, it's kind of a, a fibrous wood, a real splintery wood. So, um, mm. you know, end grain probably would be fine in that, but definitely wouldn't want to do um, a face grain cutting board with Sapili. At least I wouldn't want to. Right. You wouldn't want to have get splinters in your, in your food you're cutting up for sure. Okay. Well, cool. And let's see. All right, so that's that is purple heart. So what's another good wood to talk about here? Uh, oh, let's look at some ebony. So what we're we talking about ebony. Hand me that piece right there. So Macassar ebony. That's my favorite ebony. There are a few types of ebony out there in the world. Uh, well, I bought this piece of wood back in the 1980s, and I probably paid fifty or sixty dollars for it or something back then. And then not too long ago, well maybe ten years ago, it was the price on ebony went went through the roof. It was maybe 180 bucks a foot. Uh, but this Macassar ebony is my favorite. It has a lot of brown, chocolate brown and black striping in it. Uh, a common ebony, well not common, but a popular ebony out there is also one that's called Gabon ebony. Uh, some people also write it as Gaboon ebony, so either one's fine. That ebony is pitch black and works great for turning because sometimes you want something that's perfectly black. It's not my favorite, but that's a, that's a possibility there. Let me take a look. Oh yeah, this is black and white ebony, which is uh, this is a pin blank. I'm not really sure wh where they get the black and white ebony from. It doesn't really look like it's uh, like it's sapwood mixed with the heartwood because I've seen giant blocks of it. So I don't know what it is, but it's called black and white ebony. There. Let me take a look at where the uh... so ebony ebony is actually an Asian wood, like a Southeast Asian wood. It's also a very hard wood. And for and another interesting thing is a, for a long time. Ebony was so hard to get and became so expensive that they used to have substitutes like this African blackwood. And African blackwood used to be very cheap um, because it was a replacement for ebony, was a fraction of the price. Today, however, they you have used African blackwood so much that its price has now surpassed the price of ebony. So now you can sometimes buy ebony for cheaper than African blackwood. Um, ebony may be in the $80 a board foot range. And so all, I, all that data, I'm just reading off of the spreadsheet, which, I, which I've compiled. Um, I researched the individual things. A lot of facts I knew, a lot of facts I didn't. So I put those in there. That's that's for download. If anybody wants, anybody who's new here, uh, in the description I have a link to download this spreadsheet, and then some common definitions that are used on the spreadsheet. If you're just you know curious, like how big is a purple heart tree, how big is an ebony tree, things like that. That's kind of interesting stuff to know. Um, let me take a look here. So are ebony trees like little shrubs? Ebony trees are actually very small. Yeah, let me take a look here. Um, well, they I mean, they get up to about a foot and a half in diameter. So I guess that's not, that's not tiny. Um, oh, someone said they're, they're apologizing to Barbara because they're going to win the mallet. I have a, I, I'm giving away a mallet since we are approaching our 30,000 uh, subscriber mark on YouTube. Um, Small beans for Nick. I think he's got millions of subscribers, but for us, it's a really big deal. Hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so yeah, in celebration of that, I, I, I'm giving away a mallet. I don't know what mallet. Maybe I'll let the winner decide what what species of wood they want and what size, because we actually make, we actually make them in you know different sizes for different uh, different purposes. So maybe we'll let the where's the great big one over there. Maybe we'll let the winner decide what uh, what mallet they're looking for. Huh? Maybe they went, maybe maybe they want maybe they want this mallet. This one's this one's pretty serious right here. That's mine. You can this is size mallet. You can hammer something with it, I think. Railroad spikes. Yeah, railroad spikes. Okay, so let's take a look here. So where's the date on Wenge? Wenge, who's used Wenge in the past? Maybe somebody's used Wenge. Maybe you got a splinter. Maybe it got infected. Well, maybe for sure it got infected. Uh, Wenge is a beautiful wood. I like it. We use it here. I've made actually I've made cabinet doors with it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, you got to be very careful with it. Um, it's uh, it can be toxic. The splinters will for sure give you infections. Um, it can give you respiratory infection. It can it can cause central nervous system damage. So when you're working with it, wear a respirator. This is the most dangerous of the of the exotics that I have available. And I actually made my oldest daughter a box. She likes dark wood, so I made her a keepsake box with uh, with wenge on it. You can see it's got a stripe of wing and bird's eye maple there. I don't know if that focused, but uh, 
I made her a box out of Wenge, but once you sand it down and you get it finished, uh, it's perfectly smooth. It's really nice. Oh yeah, we made we made uh, we made we made the Batman out of Wenge. So I can throw this at people; they'll get a splinter, and then we'll, we'll win the fight. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. okay. Here's the worst wood in the planet to turn. Who's heard of um, black palm? Black? Have you have you have you seen black palm, Nick? I've seen it. I've never worked with it. Oh, it's horrible. So we tried turning this stuff, and it's 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 unbelievably splintery. I think I saw Darbin Orver on her channel, Lynn, turning this stuff, and she says the 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 stuff coming off of her lathe chisel was like hot, angry splinters or hot, angry needles. And that's exactly what it is. It's horrible, horrible stuff. It's really rough. The splinters are terrible. So I don't know. I don't like it. For some reason, I have two, two, two boards. Maybe, I, maybe I'll give one board away. But uh, yeah, I was gonna make this a mallet handle, and I gave up. So I don't like it. Ironwood is another wood I don't like. Ironwood is a is a is a common term that that's actually generally used for whatever locality that you might be in in the world. They're going to have a wood that seems to be harder than any other wood, uh, and and then the local people there will tend to call that ironwood. So when you say ironwood, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, the densest wood in, or, or the hardest, I'm sorry, the hardest wood in the world is um, Australian bull oak. I had to relook at the name here. It's uh, has a it has a Jenka hardness of 5,060. So that means it takes 5,060 pounds of force to push a marble uh, about a centimeter, a half a centimeter into wood. Uh, the, and it's just unbelievably hard. I wouldn't want to turn it. I, I turned, oh, TJ, TJ's Woodworking Shop. Thank you very much, TJ. TJ donated some money there for a super chat. Anybody who does that, all that money goes back into the shop and we make video content with it. We went full time last month and that's all we do now basically is make, make videos. So thank you very much. So the, uh, the, what was I talking about here? Um, those, the, the wood hardness. So the Jenka scale is pretty interesting. The, it, it's really used to tell if a wood is appropriate like for flooring. Uh, so oak, by example, I have oak here uh, as a reference wood. Oak has a Jenka hardness of 1,220, 1,220. And as we know, we've seen a lot of oak floors, oak flooring. So you really want your floor to be hard. You don't want to be walking on it and have your high heels dent it or step on a piece of gravel on your oak floor and have that put a, a deep hole in it. You know, that's why we don't make uh, floors out of balsa wood or, or soft maple or something like that or, or pine, I suppose. So, yeah, it's kind of a measure of hardness uh, is, how that, is how that scale came about, how hard it is to press something into the wood. Uh, but oak, it's kind of surprising here because oak, which we consider very hard, is uh, actually much less hard than all, all of the exotics by comparison. And hardness and density are different things. If you download this spreadsheet that I have in the description, it will give you some definitions, some, some uh, uh, common language definitions to help you understand the difference between density and hardness and even help you understand uh, elastic modulus. Um, I built some C-clamps, I wish I had one here, out of uh, oak. And uh, basically, as you clamp it down, the oak has to be, you know, comes under, under tension. It's going to stretch and potentially break. And how much force it will hold before it breaks is kind of a measure of its elastic modulus. And so if you want to use wood and, and have it strong and not break, then you want something with a higher uh, modulus of elasticity. So that kind of breaks that down in the explanations too. And what else? We, we have a question. Sorry. Steve does stuff. Okay. Lignum vitae is comparable to ipe. Is it? Oh, in hard, it is in hardness. I don't think it is in density. So lignum, lignum is not the lignum is not the hardest wood um, by any means. There are many woods harder. It's just the densest. So um, yeah, it's it's comparable in in hard in hardness. I mean, it's still extremely hard. Let me just look up uh, lignum here. Yeah, lignum is. Uh, so it's two two million forty three thousand uh, pounds of force it takes to uh, oh that's elastic modulus I'm sorry four thousand three hundred ninety pounds is the is the is the Jenka hardness that's what it takes to push a marble into it so I think uh, Ipe is extraordinarily hard it's just like that okay what else have I ever worked with locust I have never worked with locust don't know that Steve Osborne is is all this engineering talk I think Steve's maybe not happy we should talk about something more fun huh. <laughs> well, that, the, the modulus of elasticity isn't isn't very old. It's it's young. 
Yeah, it's Young. Right, Young's modulus. <laughs> so, so, yeah, anyways. Nick is, Nick is secretly a hidden engineer. He, claim, he claims to not, to not have uh, much advanced college knowledge, but uh, he sure does. Got another question. Got another question. Go. Um, so when you do use a more uh, hard exotic wood, do you typically change your saw blade, or is the same one you use for everything? Yeah, I don't change the saw blade. Um, I find that the none of these exotic woods that I use, I don't use teak, but none of the exotic woods that I use wear down my tools, with the possible exception of Purple Heart with a steel, a high-speed steel tool on the lathe. Uh, every all my other tools are carbide. And the carbide doesn't get dulled by by this wood hardness. You know, hardness is, gets is everybody says hardness is a problem and it dulls the blades, and it really doesn't. If you have a, if you have a, a quality blade, it really doesn't. Maybe you have to sharpen a little more frequently than you ordinarily would, but you can take this lignum and I can take this block of lignum and cut this in half uh, with uh, with a handsaw just as fast as I can cut a piece of pine in half with a handsaw. So. They're really, it's no, it's no match for a saw. I just, so I don't change my blades. Uh, DD Space DD says, I see you use purple wood. Uh, have you tried yellow heart? Oh, I have. Let me see. I have a piece of yellow heart. Oh. His, his, his piece is bigger than mine. Mine's only a little pit. Nice. <laughs> oh, it's so heavy. Oh, my yeah, God. so this is, this, is, this is yellow heart. Yellow heart is reasonably priced. It's not too expensive. This has some checks in it. Camera's trying to focus there. But yeah, yellow heart. Yellow heart is is a lot like red heart. It's just a little bit denser, so it it has it has some pretty nice workability. Um, very easy workability. It's not too oily. It glues up nicely. It cuts nicely. You can work it with hand planes. Oh, I should back up about about the hardness factor. So if if you do have woods that are very hard and you are a hand tool woodworker, then for sure you'll be noticing that you're going to have to. Uh, sharpen your hand tools a lot more frequently. So if you use a hand plane, uh, things like that, a hand router plane, you, definitely you're going to need to sharpen more frequently. Yeah, how many heart species are there? There's, uh, there's black heart, there's red heart, there's green heart. Um, yellow heart. There's yellow heart. <laughs> we just showed you that. I don't know, there's maybe more. I'm not sure. And most of those are just represented by one, by one species, actually. They're not, not a collection of species. So what else do we have here? Another thing is to keep your blades clean. I don't know if anybody's ever mentioned that to you before, but anybody who has, uh, if you're having problems with your saw, it's not cutting well or it's smoking a lot, it's probably dirty. Pitch and resin from the wood will build up on the blade naturally because uh, your blade's hot. It'll melt that out of the wood, and that'll stick to your blade. And then the next time you make a cut, that pitch and resin will cause more friction against the wood again, and it's going to heat it up even faster and get dirtier quicker. So the the as your blade begins to get dirty, it's sort of an exponential process. It'll get dirty faster as time goes by. So keep your blades clean. You know, use uh, take your blades off. Uh, use a product to clean your blades with. Um, be careful what product you use to clean your blades with. I use uh, I use a, like a product from Rockler called Pitch and Resin Remover. You can use the Simple Green makes. Is it Simple Green? What's that okay. called? Yeah. What do you What do you use, Nick, to clean blades with? Uh, well, I, yeah, I use that. Um, I'm trying to think of the the brand, the the, the Bow Shield. It's the the same okay. brand, the Pitch and Resin Remover. Okay. Were, were you going to something that doesn't that has, doesn't have any silicone in it? Yeah, yeah. I was trying to say, I was trying to say, you've got to be careful because some things will will mess with the brazing that holds the carbide onto the blade. So you make sure you use something that's designed to clean a blade. I've seen a lot of people want home recipes, and uh, just be careful with that because you don't want that uh, the carbide tooth on your blade coming off your blade and flying at your head at you know two thousand miles an hour. Yep. That might hurt a little. Yep. I had that happen with a brand new blade. Really? Yep. Wow. I, I was put the brand new blade in, and that's another reason to not ever stand in the same plane as your as your blade. But um, I turned to put the new blade in, turned the saw on. I heard like ding ding, and like I was looking around, and all of a sudden I looked up and I saw a little little gash in the ceiling, and yeah, there was a carbide thing just. Wow. Right up 
Yeah, that would be that would be frightening. Yeah, I also try not to stand in the way of the of the blade. I think every woodworker should be cautious of that. But every once in a while, you know, you just stand there. I am. I find myself standing there without thinking about it. And I've been woodworking for a long time. I'm always real cautious when I know something's going to maybe potentially have a kickback. But something you should probably be. I should probably be more prepared for. Yeah, sure. and I I had somebody mention that the other day about about kickback and everything and. Yeah, I mean, there's a million things you can do, and you can set up your table saw and all that. But but a lot of kickback, I think, is the the user not holding the wood either correctly enough, properly, the angles right. I mean, I mean, if your blade's here and your wood's going between, say, the fence and the blade, you don't want that wood going into the blade. So hold it against the fence when you're pushing it through. It's, I mean, you can see somebody pushing a board, and all you see is the actual physical motion. You don't necessarily see where the pressure is going. So something to keep in mind. Right. Yep, that's a good point. And someone's someone's ex-wife's heart is black locust, hard and thorny. Okay. <laughs> that's Dave, KSFWG. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, that's right. Barbara says she's going to win the mallet. Just resolve yourselves to it. Yeah, I might have to do something because I, I didn't expect this response realistically. I put the video yesterday. I've had already over a thousand people enter, enter. So I'm kind of overwhelmed. So I'm not sure what we'll do. I'm going to feel really bad because only one person's going to get a mallet. Maybe, maybe I'll, maybe I'll put all my mallets on my website for sale for half price for a week or something. I don't know. It, after the contest, we'll, I will figure something out. I feel bad. There's, I can't believe so many people. The last time I had a competition, there was like maybe 50 people enter. So it's kind of crazy this time. It got more bigger. Got more bigger, yeah. Patrick's workshop. Hi, Rupa. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> now TJ is leaving. TJ's leaving. Why are you leaving? Oh man. Later, TJ. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Okay, so let's see. I have. I'm not. I don't want to just go down the list of wood here. I did put balsa wood in here for if, in my list. If anybody wants to compare, I'll mention it one more time because I don't know if we've got new new viewers here. But I created a spreadsheet which has on it uh, about the 25 most common exotic wood species, species of wood that have to be imported into the United States. And uh, it's got data on the, on, the, on the species of wood, the range where the tree grows, how big the tree gets, the diameter of the tree, what the name of the species is, uh, the density, the hardness. Is it toxic? Um, is, it, is it endangered? Uh, how easy is it to work with? And most importantly, uh, how much should you pay for it? And that's free to download. It's on my, there's a link to it in the description. So if anybody's interested, you can go and get that. Oh, here's balsa. Look, balsa wood. This is a hardwood, everybody, balsa wood. So it makes great mallets, I think. I'm going to make a mallet out of this, believe it or not. So just to compare, just to compare. This is the, le the, the, the wood in the world that has the least density, and this has the highest density. So we'll have to check that out. Have to compare. This is almost 10 times the density of that but yeah so that's there and I, so I don't really want to go down I don't really want to go through the whole list and just name things one at a time because um, that'll get confusing so oh Jennifer Robinson thank you very much Jennifer Robinson with a $20 super chat thank you we really appreciate that okay uh, but I will now I think now we can just answer some questions in general um, if anybody has any questions about exotics or not, it doesn't matter. It can be anything at all. Uh, uh, we will just open up, open up to questions. So let's see. Going, going back to that balsa thing, I don't know if there's any confusion there, but because uh, uh, some people think you're almost kidding, I think. But no, like balsa, it, it's it's not the the density. Hardwood versus softwood isn't the density. It's you know, it's like a conifer versus you know. I mean, that's essentially what what they go off of. And yeah, balsa's very soft, but it's classified as a hard wood. Right. That. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it ha it ha it has a um, it's a, botanically it has a classification as a hardwood because of what it has. Um, it, if it's got leaves, uh, as the tree has leaves on it, then um, it has to be a hardwood botanically. So if it's got needles, then botanically it's a softwood. Although there are softwoods, for example. Uh, so there are softwoods that are extraordinarily hard. Japanese yew is a softwood that's much harder than oak. And, of course, balsa wood is a hardwood, which is much, much softer than any pine. 
So, so who's that? David Satoski. He's he says he wants a wingy toilet seat. <laughs> Maybe he he did say wingy toilet seat. I guess he didn't really say if he wanted one. Don't I sure wouldn't nice. want one. When that wingy is nasty stuff, it will positively give you give you uh, infections with those splinters. So I can see what my my gift for my mother in law is going to be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So okay, questions, questions. Uh, so what did we say before, Nick? If somebody has asked a question and, and we didn't see it because it flew by so fast, can they can just re rewrite it, right? Yeah, Jason Enns has got a good question. What's the best blade uh, to cut hardwoods, brand, tooth count, stuff like that? What do you think about that? Um, well, I, I'm guessing you're meaning table saw. I would say if, if it's a combination rip cross cut blade, anywhere between a 40, 50 count as far as tooth count. Um, if you're going for clean cross cuts, you're going to want to look at an alternating top bevel blade or a high alternating top bevel. Um, if you're going for like just ripping alone, you know, you can go with a flat tooth grind or, um, but combination blade 40, 40, 50 tooth alternating top bevel is probably a good combination blade. Yeah, that all sounds real good. I, I'm, I'm real particular to, I like the forest woodworker too. I put that on my table saw. And I put the Forest uh, Chop Master on my uh, uh, miter saw. So I think Forest makes a really good blade. It's important to have a, a quality blade. You can get blades at, at Home Depot that are cheaper quality, uh, for example, and they would be, um, they don't have a really high tolerance when they're manufactured. So as you spin the blade around in a circle, you'll find that it, it, it'll have some wobble to it. And the, the higher the quality of the blade, the smaller the wobble. A very high quality blade should have a wobble uh, less than 10 one thousandths of an inch. Um, as it spins around and uh, the forest ones are guaranteed and they're usually a lot less maybe two one thousands three one thousands is what I found Yeah, forest is a good brand. I've always liked Freud on their like industrial side uh, some of their Forget it's not the fusion ones, but they're they're cheaper ones. They sell in you know, like Home Depot and stuff uh, I'm not I'm not a fan of those nearly as much as say their industrial ones um, Even saw stop their what is it called platinum or titanium blade hmm. you know, marketing Jumbo, but uh, that one's been pretty good, pretty straight. Um, what, what was I going to – oh, I was going to mention, too. Uh, I just mentioned in one of my videos how I like a, an eighth-inch full kerf. It's easier to measure certain things setup-wise. And then also if you have a newer saw, that'll work uh, with, a, you know, your standard riving knife versus some of the thin kerf blades won't work with some of the riving knives. So something to consider as well. Right. I also, I also think – <clears throat> I've used thin kerf and, and the full one eighth kerf. Sometimes I find the thinner kerfs are harder in the long run to maintain uh, tight tolerance in terms of less wobble. So yeah. it takes more power and it does waste more wood to use a full one eighth kerf. But I all of my stuff is always one eighth kerf. Okay, what's next? Let's see. Uh, well, we just addressed this a little bit, but David said, "Do you think you get a better cut with a full kerf blade?" I, I think so. Yeah. I do too. I think it's I think it's a straighter cut. I just I mean it's it's a it's a more rigid you know spine essentially to the saw blade itself you know so and you know they have blade stiffeners so I have a, a blade stiffener is like a disc of metal uh, that's you sh typically I think it should be half to half to two thirds of the diameter of your saw blade. You can certainly put smaller ones on. Um, and it's maybe an eighth of an inch thicker, even a little bit thicker. After you put the blade onto the spindle, you'll put this blade stiffener on, and then you'll put your nut down on that, and that will make the blade remarkably cut remarkably better and whisper quiet. You can't always use that when you need thicker cuts, so you don't really have a choice. But uh, I, I use a stiffener for all of my thin cuts, and, and just makes them perfectly smooth. If your table saw is burning, you know, maple and cherry, and you do have it aligned, maybe you need a blade stiffener or a better blade. So okay, let's see what do we got here. Uh, let's see a couple couple questions. What was the um, uh, KSFWG Dave? He said that he bought a couple of the thin curve and he'll never buy them again. Right. Just, just bad. Uh, Patrick says he's got a thin curve on his saw. So Will, William King, he's my son-in-law, my oldest daughter's uh, husband. He's he's working in Kansas. He's waving hi, so I want to wave hi back. <laughs> awesome. All right. How was baby? What's that? How is he waving? Is it one of those emojis? No, he just says waves and. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, you got. I don't understand all this. Uh... I don't either. So I, you know, that's why I figured I'd ask. 
So let's see. What is the question? Use circular saw blade as a sieve or a sandwich though. No. Uh, Sean said, uh, can you use a joiner to square up all four sides for glue-ups? No, you sure can't. Um, you can use it to uh, – well, you, I guess you could. Uh, you, they're not going to be parallel to one another, but you, it, would, it would flatten them, and it would put them all 90 to one another if you were careful. But the problem is, is if you had a board that was like maybe like this where, where one edge was here, you want the other side of the board to be parallel. If they're like this, it wouldn't be parallel. So it, you know, if your board could be two inches wide on one side, three inches wide on another, you could run it around all four times on the jointer, and they'd still be off. Although they'd be square relative to each other, the edges would not be parallel. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be chasing 90. Each time you rotated, what was against the bed and the fence would be 90, but you're throwing the one corner previous to that off. That's true too, right? I didn't even think I about wish, that. Way. I wish um, I had a better visual, but no. I mean, it, 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 no, you really can't. Yeah, you can't. You have you have to. You need to joint one side, and then or joint one e one edge, and then you need to rip the other edge parallel to it on a table saw. And then if you want to go to a planer to get perfectly square stock, you need to go back to your jointer if you have one, um, flatten one side, and then take it to your planer and cut the other side parallel. That's the only way to get a perfectly square board. Um, now you can certainly go buy perfectly square boards. You don't have to you don't have to own a jointer and a planer to do woodworking, not by any means, but we're just illustrating the process if you if you want to achieve that and you're starting with rough stock. Um, David uh, makes an interesting comment about, he doesn't think mahogany is actually mahogany these days. Um, I. Another thing to consider too is when when boards are either you know riff sawn, plain sawn, quarter sawn from a tree, versus high production and veneer slicing, rotary veneering, um, your grain is going to look dramatically different. Different, uh, the same species will look different. Uh, you know if it's veneer cut, you know rotary veneer cut versus say quarter sawn. So yeah, right. Yeah, so, so as far as that mahogany goes, you know, uh, originally mahogany was was uh, in the Philippines, some African mahogany and Filipino mahogany, and that's what they were importing into Europe in the 1700s, 1800s when they were making furniture. When that ran out, they started looking for other sources, and they bought a wood that was very similar from Honduras, which came to be known as Honduran mahogany, which is not which is not a uh, genuine mahogany, uh, but it's very similar. And there are many other woods that are similar to mahogany. There's a wood called Luan that's used usually to skin doors with that's similar. I think Sapili in some ways is similar to mahogany. Um, but but uh, as far as genuine mahogany, it, it is now still available again. You can go, you can buy original Philippine and uh, um, African mahogany. It, it, was, uh, it was rare you know, some time ago, but it's not so rare these days. Somebody uh, asked, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just gonna say, somebody asked about, um, and I'm trying to find it, um, Gamiel Woodworks, I'm sorry if I butchered that name, but. Have you ever stabilized wood? If so, how? So I, now I really haven't other than putting epoxy in a knot hole. Maybe, maybe you have. I don't have a ton of experience with stabilizing wood. They make, um, uh, I don't know if it's Minwax. I can't remember what brand. They make a wood hardener. It's basically a super thin stuff that uh, uh, penetrates into the wood and then kind of hardens up. They also make penetrating epoxies, which are basically... Uh, you know, just super thin epoxy that, you know, you can, but then also they make products called like cactus juice and things of that nature to where you actually put them in a vacuum chamber or pressure pot and then you cook them. The, the curing is a thermal curing versus say, you know, just an air dry. Um, so there's definitely, you know, plenty of resources out there and it depends on what you're doing. If, it, if it's like a spalted piece of maple that's real punky and you want to save it, you know, that's something say different than, uh, like a lot of wood turners make, um, you know, blanks out of all sorts of, you know, different uh, acorn or um, pine cones and all sorts of goofy stuff that they want to stabilize and add add mass to hybrid blanks and things of that nature. So, but. That makes sense. I'm, I'm so distracted. I got a sliver in my sock. <laughs> and I've, I've been picking it. You know, it's like it's not one you can see, but as soon as you move, you feel like you're just getting jabbed. And so, yeah, so that's. <laughs> well, well, let's hope it's not Wenge. <laughs> exactly. Which, which, if ever, I didn't mention it, but it's spelled W E N G E. So a lot of people call it Wenge, <laughs> but, it, but it's not Wenge, it's Wenge. <laughs> yeah, Wenge. 
So someone wants to know if we recommend a a thickness planer and jointer combo if they have a small shop. And I have I, I do know a few people who have done that and they're pretty happy with it. I personally have not tried it, but it may be maybe a good option. Take that out there. Turn it off. That's the one variable that gets you making stuff. And I mean, personally, I don't think I'd, I'd want to convert that particular machine each and every time. Um, even if it's a simple kind of, you know, move this, move, you know. I, I, and then the, the surfacer portion of those is typically a lot lower, is it not? Yeah, they're a lot shorter for sure. Yeah, and I, I mean, I have a bad back. That wouldn't be that wouldn't be an option for me. But like again, I, I preface it with if if it's a small enough shop, and that's the one tool that's gonna be the magical key in the formula to say I'm gonna be making some cool stuff. I say go for it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting <laughs> because you know uh, people like Felder, they have very very high end machines which you're gonna pay fifteen twenty thousand dollars for that are combo machines. I've never had the privilege to try one of those. I don't know if it's a privilege or not. I've never tried one of those, so I wouldn't know how how good they really are. Grizzly uh, Hunter wants to know what's the purpose of stabilizing wood. Oh, I think I think you, you kind of mentioned it when you talked about it. If if it's a uh, if it's a wood that's spalted that where it's uh, where it's all breaking apart into pieces, but you still want to use it as a board, you know, you might be scared to run it through your table saw, or your jointer, or your planer. Uh, then you can you can put some sort of a penetrating uh, adhesive or something into it to get it more solid. Yeah, I mean more solid. Uh, you can you can bring back wood that is essentially rotted and bring it back and make it usable because some wood you get it to where it you, you almost touch it and it just crumbles and that's what I mean by punky. It's rotted. It's just um, so I mean a lot of like um, I guess you could call this wood stabilization, but. Uh, like the torification of wood, which is basically bringing it past its, uh, com you know, combustible temperature and the lack of oxygen so that it doesn't actually burn up. And that essentially hardens, almost case hardens the wood. So a lot of people use that for tool handles and stuff like that. So there's definitely definitely a lot of different applications on why you'd want to, or like hybrid blanks, half acrylic, because maybe it was a rotted piece of wood and it wouldn't have been big enough for a, a blank, for a pen or a bottle stop or something, then you can add some acrylic and now you have, you know, mixed media and now the wood is usable. TJ Akins wants to know what we think about oscillating spindle sanders. Um, I use mine and I use it on every single project that I need to make a curve, uh, a curve on. So if anything sees my bandsaw, it sees the oscillating spindle sander right after. Even when you read it no. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, am, I am all about this uh, spindle sander. Um, on the woodworking podcast, I coined the, the hashtag, hashtag team spindle sander. And so if you look up that hashtag on various social medias, I'm sure you could find little posts. But I love mine. I understand it's kind of a unique tool as far as it doesn't perform many tasks like a table saw does. But I, I use it a ton. And I mean a ton. So. So Barbara wants to know if the other heart woods, yellow heart, and if they change color like purple heart does. They do. Um, all exotic wood species change color. Um, in fact, some of the black woods, the dark woods get lighter, unfortunately. But yeah, they'll, almost all of them will get darker. Uh, not dramatically. You know, the yellow heart will never turn dark brown, but it'll get much darker yellow than it is. The red heart will eventually turn brown. So if you want to avoid that, you need to put a finish on it so that they stay bright. And, and we, we were talking, James and I were talking about this, uh, I think, a different day, but uh, the oxidation of wood is, in some species, revered, such as? Right. right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah, cherry. Cherry is a, cherry's a really a wonderful example. Um, people, people love the cherry. As cherry ages and oxidizes, it turns that rich cherry red color that everybody likes. In fact, some people can't wait, and so they'll go buy cherry stain for their, for their cherry wood. So yeah, in some, in some cases, many cases, they, 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 they like that. Yeah, yeah I know. With, I did a TV lift cabinet not too long ago to where it was kind of a golden blonde um, maybe a little bit, a little bit of tinge of amber in it, and a year and a half later on, what is that? A, a easternly exposure, and it's just a gorgeous, rich, almost um, auburn. Now it's just a just a gorgeous wood. 
a few people there talking about our local uh, meetup. We have a we're part of a group called Denver Makers, and uh, so Nick isn't a fan of the term maker. Uh, I actually am not either. <laughs> I, I would prefer to be called a woodworker or a chemist. <laughs> I, I, I'm a chemist, in fact. Um, but uh, anyway, there's a local group here. It's called Denver Makers, and that's what some people are chatting about. And that's I just want to bring that up because it's a good thing for any of you woodworkers out there maybe to hook up with somebody local. Locally, there's probably a club or group or an organization where you can uh, get a lot of resources from if you need any help with woodworking. And if you have a lot of experience with woodworking, you can join one of these clubs or organizations and help new woodworkers. Yep. Uh, Joe is wanting to know if, if you guys have ever – Come to St. Louis. I, I never, I never have. Well, I mean, I've been to St. Louis, but if there's a show there, I'll come. There you go. Yeah, in fact, I've never been to a woodworking show. So I, I have, I've actually been a woodworker for a really long time. I got married in uh, 1985. My wife's father, uh, also from India, he, uh, he's an engineer, and he taught me woodworking. So uh, in the in the 80s, we. Is really when I learned most everything, and then I've just kind of been evolving, you know, all along. I didn't really do anything with wood before that. I think I had a shop class maybe in high school, and uh, and so um, I've never I've never been to a woodworking show, even though I have a lot of a lot of experience. So I definitely, the, uh, I've been finding out about them over this past year since I've been connecting with some people on on the internet here on YouTube and whatnot. So I definitely plan on on going to some uh, woodworking conventions or meetings uh, next year. I got to get over to Nick's house and check out his shop. I'm sure it's sweeter than mine. So I got to steal some cool ideas from him. It's it's uh, it's always a, a comfortable mess in here. Yeah, well, here too. <laughs> there. Uh, Todd, says, where can I find a woodworking show? Not that I've looked lately, but I haven't seen any in the Philadelphia area. Check lo whether local woodworking clubs, guilds, stuff like that. Uh, the woodworking shows they they do the the East Coast, so I'm sure they have one nearby. It's most shows don't go west of the Mississippi. is is kind of is kind of what it seems. So if you're in the Pacific Northwest, that's where it's hard to find some shows. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I I think somebody I read had put up a, a link to a bunch of different shows. I'm gonna have to see if I can find a link. And maybe put that in the description. It was a website that had a list of, of different woodworking shows. So Michael McKinnon spent $75 on two pieces of zebra wood today, and he wants to know what he should make with it. Yeah, everybody in the comments section, you're going to have to give him some suggestions. What should he make with his zebra wood? Make a, make a little zebra kid's toy. Oh, there you go. Like a rocking zebra. Kind of like a rocking horse, but different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious too if we're still lagging if, if we still have that kind of kung fu movie lag with audio and video I'm just curious if it went away yeah anybody anybody can mention that to us yep so, so Stephen wants to know if there's a, a the next tool that we both uh, plan or, or want to buy uh, my I think the next tool for me is going to be oh uh, yeah a wide drum sander I'm looking at a 37 inch something wide where I can do some smaller to medium sized tabletops yeah, I'm on the I'm on the same same boat. Uh, I, I have a, a few. I I want to get a scroll saw at some point, um, so my so I can kind of get my boys out in the shop a little bit more and not necessarily worry about. I mean, they're six and eight years old, so it, I don't I don't want to necessarily have them, um, you know, on a table saw or you know on a one inch wide you know band saw blade or something. But so scroll saw, drum sander. Um, been looking at the Supermax one, and then also the Jet one for the drum sander, and then what was the, what was another one? I don't know. I think that's oh, I, w I was looking at a laser, but I've been I've been I've been dipping my toes into the the laser water, so to speak, for probably seven years, and it just you know it's one of those things. I just never 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 pulled the trigger on it. I have seen a lot of those too. I don't have a I don't have a CNC machine or a laser, but both would be cool. I I, I would like to try those. They take you know they take up a lot of space, and space is valuable. So so let's see. I saw my daughter and use Wenge as an accent in the cutting board. Would that be a problem? Huh? So somebody asked Bill R. Uh, we used we did use Wenge as an accent in the cutting board, 
And it's not a problem, you know, once it's once it's in the cutting board and it's got a finish on it. And we, we use it as a pretty thin strip, so it should not be a problem. Um, I suppose if she cuts it up and piece splinters of it come out, that that could be a problem. So, but may, maybe uh, maybe her boyfriend will get sick from it. I don't know. Uh, David said that I'd be branded as a maker if I got a laser. No, I would not. I would be a laser <laughs> operator or a laser technician. Nice. I just, I, I think, I think it's just too broad of a term. I, I got no problem with anyone else using the term maker. It's just I never liked it because it's so broad. Um, and oh, it's all inclusive. Well, I mean. If, if my dog does its business out in the backyard, did, did he make a boom boom? You know, he's a maker, you know, so I don't know. It's, it's just a little broad to me. So that, I don't, I don't necessarily need a title. I, I can be out in my shop and not have a, a title or a plaque on the wall, you know, but that's just me. Right. Uh, Nick wants to know, is Wenge toxic? Uh, Wenge, Wenge is toxic. Well, in terms of the splinters, yes. Uh, the chemical composition in it won't make you sick, but if you get a splinter, you can get an infection. Huh? Very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. In fact, sometimes you, if you get a splinter and you pull the splinter out, you will get uh, you can still get an infection from where the splinter was. Uh, not always, but you can. Well, let's see here. I don't know why I feel the need to say this, but Steven said laser beams pew pew. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just like the that the pew 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 pew. Yep. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Where are we? Uh Paul says he lives in South Alabama. They don't have they haven't heard of any shows and haven't heard of any shows. Um, you're fairly close to Atlanta. The, the woodworking show goes there. Yeah, that's the big woodworking show, right? Atlanta. That's pretty close. Yeah. Anthony wanted to know if I had uh, what kind of splinter that was in my sock. I'm sure it was just like pine, but I, I know he's just joking anyways. Oh, here, good question. TJ Atkins wants to know. Atkins, Atkins, sorry. Uh, what's the least used tool in your shop? Hmm. Wow. Probably my broom. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. I can't beat that answer. <sighs> it's not a woodworking tool, but my mom years ago, like 15 years ago, bought me a, a three ace ratchet off of, like an infomercial. And it's got a wind up like gear advantage crank on the end. It's so cheesy and so bulky and just, and it's not woodworking related, but I don't think I've ever used it to actually tighten any type of fastener. Hmm. I, I have a I have a great big impact wrench that I use to bolt together the beams in uh, for the for the the roof of my building here that I built, and we built our own shop, and uh, haven't used it since then. I have a lot of. I used to be a mechanic on cars, so I still have a lot of air tools. Um, impacts and you know stuff like that they don't get much use anymore I have a wrench that is an inverted e8 Torx on one end that uh, was for brake cylinders in Buick Park Avenues um, I haven't used that in 15 years plus so <laughs> I, okay let, let me let me personally anyways in case we didn't get to the the, the root of his question or um, woodworking tool have you bought anything, James, that you're like, oh, okay, I, I kind of want this, kind of need this, I think I'm going to use it, and it ends up being a complete flop, and you, and you kind of were like, man, I wasted my money. I spent way too much money on that. Yeah, for me, that's the one thing I'm looking at. It's right behind you. My hollow chisel mortiser I never used. <laughs> I just used mine yesterday. Wow. You know what, though? I think I – so I'm a big fan of Grizzly, but I did not like their hollow chisel mortiser. So I can't say that I didn't use it because – uh, I didn't need to. It's just a few times I tried it. I didn't get good results, and I stopped using it. So, I think one thing that it, it kind of like a public service announcement, and it's hard to when, when you make YouTube videos, people think that whatever you show in a video, that's all you do. Um, which to some people maybe, but like I'm I'm making this push block, and I was hanging out with James yesterday, 
And so I used my hollow chisel mortiser to make, you know, the mortise to accept the tenon and the, you know, well, it's a bird's eye. And it's kind of a, not necessarily a joke, but I wanted to make like this really elaborate push stick. Um, but I, I love mine. But then again, I did a lot of arts and crafts and mission style <laughs> furniture, beds to where you'd have, gosh, 60 mortises per project. So it, I've, I've gotten mileage out of mine. Mine's a Delta. It's not the Grizzly, but I, I love mine. So maybe, maybe I had a bad tool. Uh, I do want to answer this question by, by Simon Rivers. What wood do you ha have to take the most precautions when using? I just want to mention two woods. One, of course, is wenge, because I mentioned the neurological problems that you can have from the dust, and, of course, the splinters and the infections that can come from getting stuck with it. Uh, but I also want to mention uh, ironwood. There's a wood that we, we bought. It was called Suriname ironwood. It came from Suriname, and... This wood was so hard and the grain fibers were woven so tightly in it that I had it was dangerous for me to saw it for a mallet handle. I, I don't know how it would work in a large board, but on a small board, it uh, it didn't want to stay in my table saw. It wanted to it wanted it was very hard for me to push it through the blade and I have a sharp new blade. It just it was like banging around and uh, it was very dangerous wood to use in small form because it was so hard. Um, I don't know. Perhaps that Australian bull oak, the hardest wood in the world, might be might be something like that too. Uh, so yeah, in terms of in terms of toxicity, wenge. In terms of really really hard woods, really that are that the the hardness in and of itself isn't necessarily an issue, but maybe it's how the the fibers of the wood are come together in combination with the hardness that makes some woods real difficult. So those two. Um, DDDD wants to know if I've ever made a Sam Maloof style rocker. Uh, no, I've never, the, the only thing that would be close to Maloof style that I've ever done, uh, I, I've done maybe three or four times I've made a walnut, um, uh, a stool where it's very fluid and kind of, I don't make a ton of them and I haven't, uh, they're fun. They're all, I mean, they're just a ton of fun to make. Um, but they're hugely inefficient. Uh, on stock because I normally it's either 10 quarter eight quarter somewhere in there and you know your band sawing out at, by the time you get to your mortise and tenon it flares out to like a five inch wide board but then it then it comes all the way to like an inch and a quarter inch and a half and then so you got all these weird you know but that's as close as I got I, I love them I, I should be I should try and dig up I think I got a picture of one I should try and do that sometime but yeah have you ever tried it, any any kind of Maloof style Stuff, James? No, I have not. I would. I do want to build a Maloof style rocker one day, um, but I do not. I have not tried one ever. Uh, but I, I agree with you. It's going to take a lot of stock, a lot of wood to get that accomplished. So, yeah, you're going to be throwing away more than you, more than you use. I think. Well, not throwing it away, but you're going to have more more offcuts than what you use. Steve A says, "Do either of you guys own a Panda router or want one?" I don't own one. Um, I don't know. I, for for tenoning purposes, I make tenons faster with, uh, with my crosscut sled than than anybody could ever make with a panto router. Uh, for for mortises, I guess it might be okay, but I I, I do pretty good with a router. Um, I don't know. I'm, seems like a lot of a lot of gadgetry for something that's actually pretty simple. I I don't own one. Um... I, I've used them in like middle school and we're talking 20 plus years ago. Um, yeah, probably quite a bit more than that. Uh, when, where it's basically your, you know, it, it, the ratio is, you know, typically I think it's one, three to one, something like that, but where it was, it, it would engrave name badges and stuff. I don't see a huge use for me in the shop for one, nor do I for me in a, like a CNC. So, you know, I've used them. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think. I don't think I would get a ton of use out of it. I mean, me and my work habits. Maybe some people. I mean, I have a Domino XL. Um, I use for you know floating tenons and stuff on larger stuff, but um, even that hasn't seen a ton of use. That I traded a CNC for, but that's that's a whole other long story. <laughs> I would I would like to get a Domino XL I, I, or Domino either one or the XL or the regular one. I don't have one, but I do it. with the regular one. I thought that just because I, the 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 seven hundred, which is the larger one, it's 
like exponentially larger. It's bulky. It's a huge machine. Yes, Seneca makes the you know the smaller cutters so that you can do the the, the five hundred series cuts. But man, it's a it's a beast. It's a beefy machine. I, I I'm gonna get a smaller one at some point, and I might even get rid of the bigger one. Yeah. Okay, I gotta mention Jason Inns. If you guys need T-shirts, I'm a screen printer. Love to work with some woodworkers. Just put it out there. So send me an email, man. I, I'm actually we're looking to buy shirts right now. What else, what else here? CNC can do some super things. Yep, I don't have one. <laughs> uh, Steve does stuff at Nick and at James. Why is every woodworker named Steve? They're not. The two best woodworkers I know of are named James and Nick. <laughs> Good answer. I have no follow-up to that. So what wood and finish would you recommend for making 3D letters for a sign that will be outside in all of the elements? So, well, I'll, I'll tackle the wood part. Um, I would go with, uh, I don't know, I guess you could do any wood if it's finished, right? But uh, white oak lasts really good outside. Um, Purple Heart, uh, Teak, there's a lot of woods that, that, that do well outdoors. I, we should have asked if they're painting it. Um, I mean, that might sound silly, but paint, paint is, one, is a durable finish. I, I've, I've made signs. I own a sign company for a long time, and it, we would never, rarely, I should say, use wood to actually be wood grain outdoors. You paint wood grain in, I mean, it's typically on a building way up high. Or you know, anyways, yeah. I feel like I, I feel like I could just t it talk somebody's ear right off. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, they can, yeah, paint paint's gonna last forever. Several pieces of marble wood. Where is it from? South. It's from South Central and South America. I think. Wow, I should I should check that out. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get back to you in about ten seconds here. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, this episode has been sponsored by. King's fine woodwork. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for the repeat question, but are you going to post this to your channel? Yes. I am going to leave this permanently on the channel so people can uh, people can see it, you know, for all time. You have to navigate through some nonsense and some some uh, whatever to find what you want, but hopefully you can. Oh, and they're talking real quick about exterior um, wood for signs as far as if you're going to paint it. Uh, look, look for MDO. If you can get MDO in your area, medium density overlay. It's a it's a plywood core with um, a veneer of essentially MDF on both sides, and it's a veneer layer. Paints up gorgeous. Takes primer. Takes paint real well. Um, yeah, it's just perfect for um, like kind of a starting canvas for you can do cutout letters or you can do vinyl. You can do painted whatever you want. Yeah. Okay, so a couple questions. They want to know. One, Michael McKinnon wants to know if he can use Purple Heart or Paduke in a cutting board, or if they're too toxic. They're both fine for a cutting board. And the next question was: <clears throat> Todd Miller's making an eight-foot table, farm table, this weekend, and wants to know if dowel joints are just as good or better than Domino biscuits. So Dominoes aren't biscuits, but I'll, I'll let Nick answer this. Uh, he doesn't uh, own a uh, Domino, but he wants to know what's better. So. Are wood dowel joint or dominoes better? Uh, d dominoes are easier to set up, but the, the the investment on the tool is ridiculous. So um, chances are I would start with dowel joints. They're a little bit harder to set up. Make sure that you have them aligned. Get, I mean, get a decent doweling jig, um, but they can be as strong as dominoes. And, and James kind of mentioned this. Biscuits aren't structural. So if that's in your equation, you're thinking about getting a plate joiner, biscuit joiner, those are purely for alignment. Um, you actually, with a domino or dowels, they're essentially floating tenons, whether it's an oblong or cylindrical floating tenon. That's basically what it is. So those are structural. Depends on how you know what your budget is. Uh, dominoes, I think the, the, the mortiser runs, starts at like 800 bucks or something like that. So it's not cheap. You can get a good quality Dowling jig for 60 bucks, you know. Yeah, biscuits are handy, but they're, they're very weak. Someone's uh, – so Simon uh, wants uh, to use, use Purple Heart to make a jewelry box, but they have chest problems, the best respirator to use. So there are many brands, but if you get a respirator that has this yellow band around it, 
Uh, it's usually for organic vapors. And the ones that are rated for organic vapors also are what's called P100s, which means they effectively block 100% of particles. So if you get something like this, it's, it's, it's far, far better than a dust mask, which are rated at a P95, which means they block 95% of the dust particles. But this will also block any organic compounds, organic vapors, things like that, which is important if you're going to be doing any sort of a finish, if you have any breathing problems at all. If you want to use polyurethane or if you want to use lacquer, which is very strong, or if you're using any solvents like acetone or something really strong, you know, methyl ketone, something like that, get yourself a respirator with a yellow band because uh, it's good for organic vapors. Uh, another thing to, to keep in mind with, with a respirator, you could have the best respirator, but if, if you've ever been in the occupation of it spraying stuff or anything, um, they're very particular on how the mask fits. So I, you know, I don't, I'm just, I'm, I'm running with this on the fly. So I'm trying to think, how, how do you know if it fits perfect? How do you, you know, without all the fancy testing equipment? I don't know. Try and go to like a dump or something, something that stinks. Put the thing on. And if you can smell foul smells yet, it's not sealing properly. Um, I know in, when I worked in manufacturing, their, their painting masks, um, if, if they wanted to wear just kind of a nose and mouth mask, they had to be clean shaven on the face. If they wanted to wear a beard, then they had to wear a full suit. Um, so something to keep in mind. You have the best respirator in the world, but make sure it fits. Make sure it's adjusted right. And you'd be surprised. It doesn't actually have to be like super, super tight, but just make sure it fits. See how I can co completely beat up a topic like nothing? <laughs> no, that, that's good, but yeah, but I do have one more answer for you there. Um, put it, put the mask on, put your hands over the intake part of the cartridges, and inhale. If you can't inhale, it's sealed. Uh, it, that's that's a good test for it. Um, you'll be it'll it'll scare you because you're wondering like your breath's just been taken from you. But put your hand over the over the cartridges and try to inhale. That's that's a good starting point. Uh, you 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 could go to the dump like you said. You could even maybe uh, open up a can of acetone or something. Yeah. Hey, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, it's, but yeah, but that's important. Oddly enough, I, I shouldn't share this, but I wore a respirator changing diapers when my kids were little and, and people thought it was a joke, but like who would ever enjoy that? So, I mean, I, yeah, I, I knew that the activated charcoal was no longer good when I started smelling it. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, DD, DD asked a while back and I want, uh, uh Nick, do you get, um, like a ton of sponsor questions or it, it flew by, but, um, yeah, I mean, people approach you, um, I'm, I'm hesitant to take a ton of sponsors. Um, I should, I shouldn't even have brought that question up just because it's such a, a long drawn out answer with me, but. Um, I've turned down quite a few that I just don't see as a, a right fit for me personally. We'll just say that. I don't take on a bunch. Do I get a bunch? No, they're not knocking down my door by any means, but, um, yeah. Do you, I mean, how, how do you feel about sponsorship, James? I, I, I haven't really been approached very very much at all because uh, my channel is really small, I think, compared to what it, what you need to get sponsorship. But I suppose, you know, I don't think I'd have a problem with it if it was woodworking or it fell in line with woodworking and uh, – I wouldn't mind showing the tool, maybe uh, putting it into practice, letting people see what it can do. I would be, um, and you know, I take their money for it because it would help support the channel. But I don't know, I don't think I would want to. Um, at this point, I, I can't imagine I would want to take on sponsorships. You know, I, I, I did have some people contact me about light bulbs, and some people contact me about some other things that had nothing to do with woodworking, and and I didn't. I told them that really wouldn't be a fit for me. So, yeah. So Jason Inns wants to know what my email. So I'll say it real quick, but you can you can, should be on my YouTube page. It's James at kingsfinewoodworking.com. Um, and I answer questions. Anybody, if you ever email me, I'm happy to answer answer questions. But that should be on the about me page part of, of my YouTube channel. Yeah, Type Bond should sponsor me, Mac Tech 007. How come you haven't called them and told them that? I tried. I tried. They ignored me. <laughs> yeah. If 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 a tight bond offers to sponsor me, I'll take it. 
and I'll promote it, but uh, they, they don't. <laughs> Maybe they never will now because I already promote it. All right, Nick, they want to know if you can share the brand of lathe that you use and what convinced you to choose that lathe. This is from another Nick. It must be your brother. I don't know. I don't know how to spill the beans. There's, there's a whole inside joke and stuff to go along with it, but there's my lathe. Um, I don't know. For whatever reason, one day I got a bug up my butt about sharing what – because people were asking me why I was painting the lathe. A, I thought the colors were hideous as far as where it sat and all that good stuff. Um, it's a grizzly. Um, I've, I've been buying their tools for a long time, I and, I and most of their stuff I've really dug. I've had a few flops. Um, but when I asked them about sponsorship, like I want to say a couple years ago, they just had the most generic answer, and they just – their PR was just crap. I'll, I'll just say that. And w without going into it too deep, I just I just thought that their way of dealing with customers was 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 it was lacking. We'll just say that. So let's see. Steve Osborne wants to know, how do you decide how long to make tenons? So there's a lot of research done into that uh, about how long to make tenons. I actually – I have done some additional research on my own. Um, well, just researching what other people actually calculated, but uh, I'm going to oh, be talking are. about that. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about that in my next uh, my next video. But t traditionally, uh, for the maximum strength uh, for both the, the the tenon and mortise together, the tenon should be um, the the length should be five times the thickness of the tenon, and the width of the tenon uh, should be half to one third. Of the size of the of the board that gets mortised, so I, I said that all real fast. But whatever, because you the, the board that you're mortising into could be thicker or thinning, thicker or thinner uh, than the board that the tenon is on. So that's the board you need to look at for for tenon width. So, but for tenon length, should be about five times the the ten the tenon thickness uh, for maximum strength. There was research done published by Popular Woodworking magazine. Um, I think maybe 20 years ago, and there was other additional research that theirs was engineered, and there was other research done in the 1800s about it, and I'm not sure how they did it, uh, but I have links to both of those uh, uh, research pieces that I'll be pu publishing soon. Um, I was making a, a bad joke when he said, "How how long should you make your tenons?" Uh, that all depends on how long. Uh, you know, <laughs> see, I, I already screwed it up. <laughs> try again. Try again. How long should you make your tenons? Well, that depends. It's when you get done with them, that's just how long it should take. But, okay, so the, the joke, I'll, I'll give you the other joke. When you go to, like, a tailor and you're getting measured for a suit, and he's like, how long would you like the uh, the cuffs? And he's like, well, probably as long as I'd have the pants. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's what I was going for there. But That's good enough. Uh, Jason said, Nick, I heard Grizzly, try Grizzly again. I heard their customer service has improved a lot. Can't hurt. Yeah, you know, I mean, the lathe is only, uh, I want to say a year is when I got it. Um, I researched, you know, no, it's not their customer service. It's just th their, their very rudimentary way of saying no. Like, it, it basically, their, their way of saying no to a sponsorship was complete BS. And I have a problem I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I have done enough psych study to know that if you come up with a complete, complete lie and say it to somebody with a straight face, or in this case, an email, you're basically calling them unintelligent because you're like, they'll buy this. They'll buy this, this lie. You know, they'll, they'll completely, it was like, well, as you can imagine, we are approached by, and I'm like, what is this, a political thing? Come on, just say, hey, I'm not digging what you and your channel do or something. I appreciate honesty above all else. But anyway, so, yeah, it was – Cool. <laughs> you got to get me off that topic, James. That's well, a... Okay, Sai wants to wave bye. She's got to go inside and do some schoolwork. So bye, bye everybody from Sai. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh... D D D D King, easy question for you. How about how many Craig screws do you use in a month? Oh, three to six million. It depends on what I'm building, I suppose. I, I use Craig screws like I use glue. 
I don't know. I don't know how many I use in a month. I used a lot for my miter station. I know that. Um, I use more than I should. I, I put them about every three or four inches instead of every whatever eight. I'm not sure what they recommend, but um, when I do shop cabinetry, I use Craig screws. I don't. I don't use them for fine furniture, but I probably used uh, 500 in that 600, 700 in that project. But I don't. I don't use them all the time. A year could go by without me using them, so it's not regular for me. Do you use those, Nick? I don't do a ton of your echoes back, by the way. Oh, no. Okay. Just maybe just click the mute button in the room and then unclick it. Okay. Any, any better? All right. I think, it, I think it's away. Okay. Um, what was the last question, though? Uh, Craig Screws, do you use oh. them? I don't use a ton of pocket holes. I don't. Um, no, I mean I use I use the Craig brand screws just because I think it's a lot easier for me to buy those kind of washer molded in screws. But I don't do a ton of pocket holes. I got I got nothing against pocket holes. I, hey, what a, you know I I like pocket holes way more than I like Term Maker. Yeah, <laughs> Amber Price just uh, left a, a ten dollar super chat. She asked, "What does this button do?" I I hope she knows what she was doing because she left ten dollars there. Uh, uh, click it again, Amber, and see. <laughs> <laughs> click it. Well, uh, well that's so. That's a, it's a super chat, I guess. That's a, it's a location to where you can you can donate money to the channel, is what that is, and you did. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, uh, Al wants to know if I had the the Laguna band. So yeah, it's the 14 BX. I don't know how much I can show of it there. It's taller than that, but uh, that thing's a beast. I absolutely love it. I don't know what else, if there's anything else to add to it or not. But um, yeah, I also have their dust collector too, which I just got hooked up, I want to say, less than a month ago. What do you think about Laguna in general? Their tools look pretty good, but I've never had the opportunity to, to use one. Um, so far, I'm super pleased. I know in the, in the past, people have said their customer service was lacking as well. Um, I've heard that through a few different sources, but. Uh, every every dealing that I've had with them has been absolutely pleasurable. Uh, it's been very pleasant. Um, I wanted the Italian style bandsaw with the with the straight spine, as opposed to say you know um, you know the, the Western style where it's more of a cast iron and it kind of I, I just I, I kind of like that design better. So that's why I went with Laguna over say like a Jet as far as the bandsaw. But that thing's a beast. I, yeah, so far so good. I'm digging all Laguna stuff. I only have two Laguna things, so that makes me far from an expert. <laughs> Steve Osborne says there's a lot of hate out there for pocket hole joinery. Yep, there sure is. Uh, that's why I made a, I made a video testing pocket hole joinery, and I drove my my Ford Excursion onto it. My truck weighs 8,800 pounds and I drove the front tire up on a ramp that I built just with pocket holes to show people that it's actually strong. A lot of people think it's pretty weak, but it's it's not if it's uh, done correctly. I'm raising my uh, my bandsaw. Uh, somebody asked what the resaw capability is. I want to say it was 13 and a quarter, but I had to raise it, I had to raise it and measure it. To, yeah. I aim to please. What can I say? <laughs> Thirteen and three eighths, we'll call it comfortably. Um, I, I bet you any money if you finagled the the ceramic blocks, you'd get thirteen and a half. But we'll call it thirteen and three eighths to be safe in case in case you're looking at buying that one and you want to cut a bunch of thirteen and a half stuff. That's pretty good. I mean, if you can cut, if you can resaw twelve inches, that's pretty darn good. Yeah, and, and that's uh, and I have their three quarter inch resaw king carbide tip blade on it, and uh, I've been really digging that blade. I don't think it ended up in any of my videos yet. I know it's one I'm editing, but oh yeah, it's that pine box. I resaw it and literally brought it over to a sanding block, hundred grit, and I'm three four times, and it was it was smooth again. So, I gotta I gotta mute my sorry my uh, notifications here have just came back on they're dinging. 
Yeah, Anthony E thinks I cheated and uh, uh, used tight bond to hold my ramp together before I drove my car on it. Maybe I did. Maybe I did. Another thing to to keep in mind with with pocket hole screws, save versus mortise and tenon, is I mean I like the traditional stuff. And now, granted, I have a hollow chisel mortiser, so that's not traditional. That's not a mortising chisel to you know. But it's all based on application. Um, and in like say face frames for cabinets, pocket hole screws are absolutely one hundred percent perfectly fine. You're never going to see the back side of them, and they're not subjected to the you know the rigors of like leverage and you know it's it, it, they're a face frame on a cabinet. So uh, I choose to go with mortise and tenon, but but then yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people are talking about Matthias Wandel's test uh, for pocket holes uh, compared to mortise and tenons, but um, I, w I guess I won't comment on that. Yeah, I, I, James and I have talked about that, and more to come. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it's nothing in, in bad, you know, it's just, anyways. Rupa says our numbers are going to go down because Cy went in. Size done. <laughs> but I, I think they tune in to watch her there. So, thoughts on Stanley hand planes? Are they the original Stanley hand planes or the ones they make today? I think the you original might, ones are pretty good. Go ahead. You, well, I was just saying, you get the comments a good second and a half, two seconds before I do. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, because I'm like, who said that? Then all of a sudden, <laughs> it pops up. Yeah, because somebody had a super chat not too long ago, and you thanked him before it showed up on mine, and I'm like, is he making stuff up? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, the old ones I think were great. I don't think the new ones are, are made to those, you know, same quality that they used to be. Here's a good one. Jason Inns, the best way to get angles correct, uh, a Wixie. And can you find precise angles without an angle tool? Um, well, I'm not sure what he means without an angle tool. Uh, and I, I'm presuming you mean on the table saw. My my table saw just dials the angle for me, but I have never used that that Wixy. Do you use that, Nick? Yeah, I do. Um, and yeah, by angle tool, I'm guessing he means anything that you know, an, an auxiliary device to to try and set up for angles, whether it's a sliding T bevel or the Wixy Digital um, protractor. I guess is what you you almost want to call it, the angle gauge. Um, yeah, there's the, of course there's ways in which to uh, you can make a, a square. Gosh, let me – I don't want to, you know – all right. The more I talk about it, the more I'm just going to grab one. Because um, I, I think I, I mentioned this on either mine or your live show once. Um, but a square – let's see here. I, I like sharing this because I think it's halfway important. Um, but to check if a square is square. Now, now, picture, though, we're not checking to see if a square is square – Say you make a square and you have nothing to check it against. You don't have, you know, an actual square, to, you know. So if you get a piece of wood and you know that one side that you're registering your square off of is a straight line, and I'm going to try and do this and hold it to the camera, um, and then you mark a line. I'm using marker just because it will show up. And then you flip your square to the other side, and then you mark a line. Those lines – should be parallel if it's square. So you could make a square out of wood, and if it's not square and those lines aren't parallel, tweak it, test it, tweak it, test it. So you don't need technology to tell you that it's you know 100%. And then from there, you can make a square. I mean, a square piece of wood, not a square to measure. So if you can make a square piece of wood now, cut that in half, and now you have 45s. So see how I just go and I just blow up the topics. It's just, but you can start with nothing and end up with perfect 45s. You could bisect the 45, end up with your 22s and a half. You could end, end up with a 30, 60, 90. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can find, you know, look up geometry proofs and, and the proof will be in the pudding. Yep. Nick is a big geometry buff. He loves that geometry. I, I do. I, I, it's, it makes sense to me in my head anyways. Well, Jason Inns has a couple squares. He needs nine degrees. That's pretty tough, Jason. I think you better get a bevel gauge and, uh, and a protractor. 
if that's the case. Uh, well, either that or, again, just look up the, the geometry. I can't uh, off the top of my head, but uh, whatever the triangulation. So, you know, I'm sure you can go on to some. The hypotenuse will be one measurement. The long leg of the triangle will be another measurement. And you'll, you'll be able to figure that out. Cut that out somewhere, and then you can use that as your template. You'll know that that's nine degrees off of, you know. Larry said he would have understood your explanation better if you were singing it, Nick. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Did I sing on the last one? I can't remember. It's possible. Oh, no, it's Cecile. <laughs> So someone else seems to like that Wixy gauge. How is that? Is that an expensive uh, tool? Um, well, expensive is subjective. Sure. Um, I think they're thirty to forty bucks somewhere in there. Okay. I have the Wixy digital height indicator, which I use to check the height of the blade on my table saw. I like that a lot, and that that's also maybe in the twenty dollar range. That's uh, I think that's a good tool to have. I'm pretty co comfortable with those. I use a Wixy to. Uh, uh, for my planer, also to get the exact height on my planer. So I think they make they make pretty decent stuff. It's not uh, maybe super high end, but it's it, it works pretty well. It seems to. Man, I must have been singing last time. People are talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as far as I can tell, though, the Wixie gazes are fairly accurate. The one I have is an older model, and so it's not a backlit LCD screen. Uh, like the Indiglo or whatever they call them, the new ones are. And I've, I've almost been, like, careless with mine to where, oh, it dropped, it broke. I'll have to get a new one with the, you know, Indigo, Indiglo um, backlit screen. But, yeah, they're fairly accurate. I want to, you know, I want to believe they're fairly accurate. I've never – I've tested them against some pretty decent squares and, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, a lot of people apparently use them there and like them. Wixie and eye gauging, uh, Mac Tech 007. I also like the eye gauging stuff. I use that for to set the to set my blade uh, parallel to my uh, miter slots on my table saw. <laughs> you read? Are you reading all those there for you, buddy? Yeah. Well, you're making this available after the fact, so I'm not going to read a whole lot of them. <laughs> yep. There, yeah, there's a Harbor Freight style Wixie one. Uh, if if you guys are in the kind of the 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 north central north east area, Menards has their Master Force brand of the Wixie. I think it's the same patent number. I like mine. I, I guess that's my consensus. Is I I really like mine. I use it on. Not only the table saw, but the band saw, uh, all sorts of things. Always remember that whatever they have for um, the electronics in there to actually get, you know, plumb and, and level and stuff, um, it, there's a, a zeroing button. So don't be like, you know, zero it, shake it all over, and then, then put it on something and go, oh, it's not 90. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly ginger with, you know, like just I'm fairly delicate with it, zero it out, and then move it to the blade and, I don't know. Yeah. So someone wants to know, uh, DD there, uh, have we ever uh, used or seen the product made by Lee Valley uh, called the taper, Tapered Tenon Cutters? They've been thinking about buying them, and they'd like to get our thoughts on them if we have any. I have never heard of them or used them. Uh, the Veritas ones? Um, I saw a picture the other day, and it's kind of like a V, and then there's two blades. Um. Other than that, I know nothing about it. I've used the um, the timber, you know, the cutters where you put them on, you know, around, you know, like four inch, three inch diameter log, and it'll cut tenons. And then, you know, so for like kind of rustic cabin type furniture, I've used those. Is that what that is? Um, I think that's brand new from Veritas. Um, but anyways. So Joey Morrell, Merrill, Joey Merrill, uh, he says building an aquarium stand, he needs it to be able to support about fifteen hundred pounds. Uh, what joint would you recommend for supporting the weight? That might be a little technical uh, for us to get into here without seeing, you know, your, the type of wood and how big your boards are, and you know, if you're using mortise and tenon, how big they are. Uh, just approach that carefully. You could most definitely build something that could hold fifteen hundred pounds, um, but. 
you know, if you want to send me a drawing, I could look at it. Um, <laughs> it's hard to. Can, do you have a quick answer for that or an easy answer for that, Nick? Uh, no, I, I'm pretty much going to respond the same thing as you because there's too many variables to give an absolute answer on. Um, on yeah, exactly. What wood? What species? Spacing, thickness. Um, yeah, there's just there's just too many variables. I was I was walking off to get some one two three blocks. Oh, nice. Yes. Uh, I I don't know why they're bringing them up. Uh, oh, David said he's been looking at getting some. I use mine for a lot of things. A, they're perfectly square in every direction if you get a decent enough quality one. Uh, they're one inch by two inch by three inch. So keep that in mind. The generic ones, I'm not a machinist, and these are kind of generic ones. Uh, the holes should actually be different sizes so that you can bolt them together so that you can get an, an actual cap screw through here and then thread into the other one for setting up jigs and fixtures. These are a cheaper version, so they're not that way. They are threaded, um, but yeah, and set up stuff, they're completely square. They're exactly one inch by two inch by three inch. I use them all the time. So Steve does stuff wants to know if you use that rigid planer behind you. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've, I've used it multiple times on my channel. Um, I've ran plenty of uh, running feet through there. Um, it's it's a lunchbox planer. That's you get snipe. Even if you put the. the the thing behind Snipe is, I, in, at least in my opinion, my humble opinion, it, it costs, or it's caused by two different things. The board's coming in and out feeding, not, you know, completely straight. Then also the cutter head tilting. Um, I was going to let you get to that super chat. Yeah, okay, that's Joey who had the question. Thank you very much, Joey, for doing that. Uh, you have my email address. Uh, it's in it's in the About uh, page description. I'll, I'll say it again quickly. It's james at kingsfinewoodworking.com. If you send me a sketch, I will help you with that. I, I do custom plans a lot. I'll help you design something that will that will hold three times that weight, no problem. There you go. But anyways, yeah, it's it's your kind of your standard lunchbox planer. I love it. They're expensive, so um, to, to your kind of beginner woodworker, any planer is going to be expensive. Check for used, but um, just make sure that you're going to be running boards through it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to buy it. If you're getting S4S lumber, um, you know, or select pine or something like that, but you can save a lot of money. Essentially, if you do it right, a thickness planer, whether it's a lunchbox, a four poster, a floor standing, they pay for themselves if you use them enough, quite literally pay for themselves because if you're building a project out of S4S, you're going to pay on average more per board foot for somebody else to do that. And if you can surface roughs on, um, you can save that money. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to mention those rigid tools. I have used that exact rigid planer, and as far as the lunchbox planers goes, that one's great um, if anybody ends up buying that. And I have several other rigid tools like sa some sanders, and belt sanders, and uh, uh, random orbit sanders. They work really good. Uh, I have rigid nailers, and ri you know, rigid, I think, has a lifetime guarantee if you buy them at Home Depot and you register them. Um, so it's a tool that's, uh, uh, as far as tools go, that it's not at a really high cost point. It's, uh, it, it's, so it's a, it's a good price. It's a good quality tool. And with a lifetime guarantee, you know, you really can't beat that. So, so I'm a fan of rigid. I don't own a whole lot of them, but the ones I do own, I have enjoyed and I think they, they definitely perform uh, very well. I do use a lot of DeWalt. Uh, Ryan Petzl uses a DeWalt 735. I have seen those as well in action up close, and that's a fantastic uh, planer for sure. Uh, someone bought, let's see, oh, Dave there, KSF WG, bought a uh, port cable planer and joint are new in the box for 400 on Craigslist. That is a good deal. Who's that person way in the back behind you? Jyoti, you got to wave. This is my oldest daughter. Uh, Jyoti, uh, J-Y-O-T-I. Spell your name for him, Jyoti. Oh, I guess whenever you comment, huh, it spells it. Yeah, she's my oldest daughter. She uh, helps us out in the shop all the time too, and she's helping me by answer some, answering some questions. And Maya, that who just answered there, that's uh, uh, my middle daughter. I have five daughters. Uh, she's in Arizona at the moment, and uh, she's uh, she also is helping us out by answering some questions. 
And let's see, have you so uh, replacing the cutter head? Yeah, so you can replace the cutter heads in uh, in some of those planers. I think you can on the Dewalt for sure. I'm not so sure about the rigid. You can, but for the Dewalt, you can put in a spiral cutter head. If you're going to be be cutting wood that is uh, figured, like bird's eye maple or or quilted maple or wood that's a little more delicate, it will produce a much cleaner and neater, nicer cut. Um, Spiral cutter heads are great because if you nick a blade, you just nick one of the uh, one of the many many uh, square carbide blades that are in there, and you just rotate it 90 degrees, and everything is just fine. After that, you don't have to replace an entire set of blades, which is pretty handy. Um, I'd like to bring this up because I, I the, the day I learned this, I thought was absolutely like one of those mind blowing things. But James is 100 percent right on the not on the straight blade planers. Uh, you get a lot more tear out and stuff, and, and I mean it depends on the wood. But say bird's eye maple, he mentioned those little bird's eyes can pop out. In fact, I even had one on here, and yeah, you're not gonna be able to see that. But, but so you would think like, oh well, I'll just do a smaller and smaller cut, and so it's not that aggressive, and they, it won't pop out. The smaller and smaller the cut you do. The more it actually wants to rub and grab those bird's eyes. So if, if you take a good, you know, 16th or whatever it is and take a hefty cut, a lot of times it'll slice through and you get better results with taking a thicker cut than, say, something like a, a 64th or something. Right. I mean, it seems counterintuitive, but it quite literally works. Yeah. So let me see those right there, Rupa. Um, we, uh, we I've had a bunch of people request stickers. I've been out of these for a long time. I just have got some stickers back in. So if anybody wants a sticker, if you just email me um, your uh, address, I'll send you a sticker. Anywhere, worldwide, doesn't matter. I want to hear from Kevin. Oh, hey, it's Kevin Miller. Um, he just said that he, he changed his, I'm guessing he changed his rigid over to a helical cutting one if, if Kevin if you could confirm that and then while I was I didn't know Kevin was watching I'm glad he com commented but I'll thank him he gave me this uh, I was showing this rosewood handle earlier and Kevin actually gave me this Carter and Son 5 ace bowl gouge so thank you I don't know if he was in the room when I showed that very nice But yeah, I didn't. I didn't think you could change the cutter head on the rigid. Uh, but, uh, then again, I don't think they make this exact one anymore. It's the 13 inch mm. lunchbox. So, right. I just I remember people commenting on changing it for that Dewalt 735. Kevin saying, "Yeah, he changed it on the rigid." So that's nice. Um, okay. It's something, something to look at. Um, the reason I probably won't ever change mine is because again that cutter head. That's often one of your culprits to snipe is that your in-feed roller kind of accounts for that board coming in, and now your cutter head is kind of you know, hanging down and keeps going. So I would like a standalone floor model four-poster at some day where that, you know, that thing is not going anywhere. But Yeah. <clears throat> but Kevin has confirmed it, yes, that you can – change out the cutter head, straight blade cutter head in that rigid lunchbox for um, a helical head. I said, and Kevin's got some friend requests there. It looks like Joe <laughs> wants to know if Kevin can be his friend as well. He gave me a whole tub full of pen blanks, too. He was in Green Bay when, when Jay and April were visiting. He had a business thing, and we actually went out – Kevin and I went out to dinner with April and Jay, and just good times, fun, fun stuff. People are fighting over the mallet still. I might have to give a couple of those away. It's crazy. So uh, DD, DD wants to talk about dust uh, collection in the shop. I'll start because it's easy for me. I just have some portable machines that I wheel around. Uh, one is just uh, I have two rigid vacuums that I take around and plug into my smaller stuff. And I have one. Um, it's made by Rikon, I think. I got it at Woodcraft. It's a, like a one-horsepower small unit on wheels. Uh, that I with a four inch pipe, I take that and plug that into my table saw. So I just kind of move mine around as I need it. I don't have a central dust collection system. It's something I will do at some point, but I don't have it now. Me, um, 
I have uh, for uh, sanding because that's kind of your wood flower, your fine stuff. Uh, I had this before my Laguna dust collector. Sanding, I, ha I have a Festool, I think it's a CT48, uh, the HEPA filtration. Um, that I, I typically only use on my pneumatic DAs anyways. Um, I have an ambient air filter. It's a WEN ceiling mount jobber, super cheap. Um, works pretty decent for the price. The value is definitely there. And then I had a Harbor Freight dust collector that I'd really only hook up to like my thickness planer when needed. And I just recently uh, installed my Laguna, the P-Flux 3. It's a big unit, HEPA filtration. Uh, and I just have one PVC trunk on the ceiling that goes down and it YTs off into my table saw. And then just in a, an accessory one that I'll use on my drill press or my router table or whatever. Not a big elaborate setup at this point, but captures a good deal of, again, it's how you work. I mean, if, if you're on the lathe 24-7, you're going to want some sort of sanding shroud and piped over. That's like your number one thing that you're going to want. To, or if you're sitting there on the scroll saw and that's all you do, well, then you're going to want to figure out, you know, dust collection for a scroll saw. But yeah, hopefully that helps. So I have to say hi to AD, ADY. I'm not sure how he pronounces that. Uh, he's uh, someone who comments a lot on my channel, but uh, hello. <laughs> I'm guessing Addy. Addy, that sounds good. Good to me. Uh, William Strongbird wants to know, what about separation? Do you have a, is, is yours a cyclone separator? Yeah. Um, let me, let me click on me. I don't know. Oh, you guys can't see it. Like the, the bandsaw is pretty much right in front of it. Um, I don't know if that, yeah, that helps a little bit. Yep, There's that's it. Uh, but behind go, Oh, let's see the, the camera's backwards going that way is the actual HEPA filtration. And then like I said, I have a couple coming up there, but that's a built-in cyclone. What I actually really, really like about this one, and there's no way for me to get in there without just giving you guys plumber's crack, but um, that, that handle, that hoop just swings up and then this container drops and it's on casters and that's how you empty it. And I know that gets brought up a lot. What do you guys do with all your planer shavings, all that good stuff? I bring mine to the local, um, like compost heap. It's all wood. I mean, I don't use pressure treated, so um, they have no problem with me putting it there. It kind of helps kickstart the compost because the surface area to mass ratio is there in wood shavings that big chunks of wood, it's not. So, yeah. Yeah, that definitely would, would do that for sure. We, we, if we have perfectly clean planer shavings, we take it like oak or, or maple or something, we take it to our animal shelter here. So if money were no object, what would be your next tool purchase? We sort of answered this. Well, if money were no object, hmm, I don't know. I might have to look at one of those giant uh, $20,000 Felder machines. I'm not sure. I probably, I, I probably, the next thing I really need is a, is a wide belt sander. We mentioned this earlier, but I know we have a new, probably a new uh, population of people here than what we had earlier. So I, I would be looking for a wide belt sander or a wide drum sander. I can't afford a belt. Sander. Why drum sander? No, but the, the idea was if money was oh. an object. <laughs> okay, I, I, then I take that back. I, I will have a wide belt sander, thank you, a 51-inch. Maybe dual belts, uh, and they should oscillate. Yes. and But those machines are, I think, averaging right now like $250,000, something like that, isn't it, right? Well, I saw I've seen cheaper ones like for for small shops in the in maybe thirty forty forty thousand dollar range, but yeah, the big ones are pretty crazy. Then again, I should just get the big one and I can sell that and buy a new shop. <clears throat> yeah, I mean it, it's hard. It's hard with the question if money was no object. Um, it, okay, I, I got almost a perfect answer for this. If money was no object, obviously I'd I'd go for the oh bigger shop, all this other stuff, but I would have like two table saws and two band saws just so I could have like a quarter or like a three eighths half inch blade on one band saw and a one inch resaw blade on another band saw. Cause I hate changing those. And I'd love a table saw that has a 10 inch blade, eighth inch curve. And I'd love a three quarter inch uh, dado stack on another. Yep. That would so, be nice. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, if money was no object, yes, I would, you know, I mean, that 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 sounds fun to me. Nice, but I'd rather change out table saw blades than a bandsaw blade any day. Yep, I agree with that. I I have uh, my bandsaw in the back. I don't know if 
anybody can see that back there, Jyoti pointed the bandsaw. We have a big grizzly 19-inch bandsaw, and uh, it's a beast, but it holds an inch and a quarter blade, so we can do real saw, resaw real nicely. But it takes uh, it takes like about 45 minutes to change the blade, and it's difficult. So I've only put that blade on once in a year, and uh, I won't I won't put it on again until I have a lot of stuff to resaw or a lot of lumber to try to cut into some planks. TJ wants to know, isn't that what Mark Spagnola had from uh, Wood Whisper? And Eric? I don't know what he's referring to. The multiple band saws or multiple table saws? I. I think he did have two bandsaws. He had, he had, he still does. Um, he has two bandsaws in his shop here. He's in Colorado now, but he has a, a bigger one that he keeps his resaw blade on. It might only might be a half or three quarter inch blade. I'm not sure, and a smaller one with a quarter inch blade for you know cutting curves. He does, oh. he does do that. Yeah, I mean, I have. I mean, okay, so if money was no object, um, no, I have two bandsaws. I got the one that I just spun around. The the Laguna I got not too long ago. I absolutely love that thing. But then you can probably see my Rikon sitting on the bench up there. And, yeah, it's just the, the Rikon's not nearly as accurate. It's not nearly as powerful. And remember, the question was if money was no object. Right. <laughs> Kevin Miller wants to know a question about refacing cabinets. Knock the original oak face frames off and replace or just do the veneer overlay thing. So... Yeah, I would take the – if you want to keep the cabinet carcasses, that's fine, I suppose. Um, I would just replace the cabinets. I only build Euro-style cabinets, which means they have no face frames. Um, I've done I've done kitchens for quite a while. I've built um, many, many, many kitchen cabinets um, and high-end kitchens as well. But all I've ever done, even low-end kitchens, all I've ever done is, is uh, the Euro-style, which is no face frame. You just build it. Uh, the carcass is heavy duty. It's all three quarters, the body of the cabinet itself, and the doors attach uh, to those like with Euro style hinges. So I suppose if you're going to do uh, face frame stuff and you leave the, the cabinetry in, uh, the carcass is in, I would just, I would take the, I would take the oak off. I wouldn't try to veneer uh, what you have there. I, but so I guess I can't really answer that too accurately. I don't have a lot of experience with, with redoing or, or re-veneering um, cabinets. Here they, they veneer the face frames uh, 99 times out of 100 rather than remove the face frames. Uh, now, granted, when you open, they don't veneer and wrap it. If you open the door and say it's veneered in maple, you still see the inside, you know, inside edge of the face frame is still oak or whatever the previous wood was. Um, and then they just hang new, new doors. Um, I don't like that, but I know a lot of people do that real quick to up, you know, it's, it's a cheap, uh, it's a pretty reasonable return on investment if you're selling your house to go from, say, golden oak to some sort of maple. Um, it depends. Yeah, I, I, I would I would veneer the face frames. That's just me. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't real familiar with that. Um, so there's, someone's there's talking company, about, go ahead. There's companies called like kitchen refacers. Oh, okay. Right. Rather, if, if the carcasses are still structurally sound, you can save a, a, sub, a substantial amount by just they, – they make brand-new doors. so And then they take – a lot of times they take the old hinges, you know, that, that weren't a self-close or a soft-close or a Euro-style. And so they come in, strip all the doors, the drawer fronts, everything. They reface and uh, veneer the face frames and then hang new doors. So when the doors are closed – yeah, it looks like a brand new set of kitchen cabinets for the most part. I see. Okay. Yeah. So Joe, I uh, can't say your last name, Joe. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I'm sorry. You wanted. Uh, you said something about uh, – someone asked about Baltic Birch, and he said you can get it at Home Depot, I think he said that. But you can't get Baltic Birch at Home Depot. You can buy birch plywood, but certainly not Baltic Birch. Um, Baltic Birch is uh, pretty special in that every layer in the plywood is Baltic Birch, and it should be void-free or very nearly void free and all of the layers, all of the plies should be the same thickness. It's a very special uh, grade of plywood, a cabinet, high-end cabinet grade. And it's really not something that Home Depot carries. It's not at any Home Depots in Colorado that I know of and it's not listed on their website. So I'm not so sure that other places would carry it either. Typically we have to go to a hardwood dealer uh, to get it. Um, where, do you, where do you get it there, Nick? I, I'm pretty spoiled. There's a, a locally owned company uh, a little mom and pop shop that all they sell really is sheet goods and they have it. Um, 
we, we've joked about this. James and I have joked about this before. I've seen in local home improvement centers uh, domestic Baltic birch plywood. Like that's what it's advertised as. Well, that, I mean, that's, you know, uh, pretty counterintuitive. That's pretty, you know, contradictory. Um, I don't know if Home Depot nationwide don't sell it because I know certain Home Depots sell pure bond plywood and they don't buy me. Um, but a true Baltic birch plywood, no, is not. It's not available by me in any of my big box stores. Um, I have to, you know, go to a specialty supplier for it. But I mean, oh, so he did clarify. He said you, they can order any type of wood from you for you. Just talk to them. So you're right. They they I, they can do that. In fact, when I built my shop, I ordered micro lamb beams for the for the for the roof structure, and they of course they don't sell or stock those there. But yes, the the manager in that in the uh, maybe the pro department up front, they do have resources where they call, they order it, they bring it in, you pay them for it, Home Depot for it. But in that sense, I suppose maybe they could get it for you. David said he doesn't understand how Baltic birch isn't available to everyone here. Baltic birch is considered kind of low end. Then I would like to know what you consider high end plywood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've boy, I've used a lot of plywood. Uh, there's, I've never seen anything uh, better than Baltic birch. Nothing even comes close. I even. I, mean, low was I wasn't trying to be a, s a smart aleck. I was just, I mean, I, if there's something else better than Baltic birch out there. Now, granted, you're not building cabinet carcasses out of Baltic birch unless you got money coming out the yin yang. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious. Well, Woodcraft Store carries it, but not full four by eight. No, I, Baltic birch traditionally is five by five sheets. Um, nobody knows 100% why, but the molds they make it in is five by ten. It can be special ordered as four by eight, but it's it costs an arm and a leg because. You're th it, it, it doesn't yield much in a five by ten mold, you know, to get a four by eight sheet. Yep. So there are there are a few places that will make it in four by eight, and I think they cut it from the five by ten, and it, it, you pay a lot more money for it. But yeah. five five by five is the best way to buy it. And he's right, Woodcraft and Rockler both will carry Baltic birch. They sell it. But they, of course, don't sell full five by five. Typically, you buy what a thirty by sixty or thirty by thirty. Some component of the five by five is what they typically sell. Okay, David clarified that we we make cabinets um, like expensive walnut plywoods and stuff like that. Well, yeah, I mean, but we're talking kind of a, like a birch faced. You know, you're you're not talking about like angel tears and rainbow farts. You know, veneered on, uh, you know, cork board and and hope. You know. I don't know. Did that make any sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think we're, we're we're talking two different things. I think he's talking about the quality of the of the outermost veneer, like being a nicer wood, maybe like uh, a walnut or or something like that. And I think we were talking about the quality of the veneers on the inside. Yeah. So the quality of the veneers on the inside are better in Baltic birch. Unfortunately, you can't buy a Baltic birch that has a plywood veneer on the. I mean, I'm sorry, that, that has a walnut veneer on the outside. It's it's uh, it's Baltic birch the whole way, but yeah, certainly there are prettier plywoods. Uh, you can buy a walnut plywood. You can buy cherry plywood. I've seen, I've seen exotic plywoods. Uh, Paxton, the hardwood dealer here, 25 years ago, they used to sell ebony plywood, four by eight sheet. It was cut an ebony of Macassar ebony veneer. It was very expensive. You can actually buy. I have a sheet of bird's eye maple plywood here. That's beautiful stuff too. But the veneers on the inside aren't that great. And, you know, to boot, I, I, I'm sorry, I was answering a question out the outside, so hopefully this isn't what you just said, but uh, stability. I mean, because if you're making like a shop jig or things like that, and you want stability, you don't, dimensional stability. Uh, MDF will give you dimensional stability, but it won't give you strength in, in multiple directions, and it just kind of breaks away. There's no strength, you know. So hopefully, hopefully, I just did. I just repeat exactly what you said. No, no, you 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 kind of enhanced it. That's cool. I, I'm reading the comments. Everybody's going on about uh, angel farts and angle farts and, and and all kinds of funny stuff now. That, that's what I was. I that's one of my things that I you know like rainbow tears and angel farts uh, is, is is something I utter from time to time. Also, I want to answer this. Kevin Miller said, "So James, did you end up epoxying those C clamp?" Handles so the C clamp that I built on my on my uh, channel, 
and then I compared to uh, uh, Matthias Wandel and, and John Heise's uh, C clamps. Uh, those are Type Bond three, and so popular um, uh, woodworking magazine got together with. I, can't, I think it's a university in Texas. I can't recall, but I did put the link in my description, and they did scientific research on uh, half a dozen different species of wood and several different adhesives. Uh, Tight Bond 3 was one of the adhesives, and epoxy was one of the adhesives as well. And they found that the very strongest glue joint that could be had was uh, was red oak with Tight Bond. And I, I believe it was actually Tight Bond 3. Type Bond 3 has a, has a higher bond strength than the other two Type Bonds. Not a lot, but a little bit higher. And so that, uh, that joint together with Type Bond 3 is far stronger than it would have been with epoxy. And if you look on that and look back to that, uh, that video, I do have a description or I do have a link to that research study. Um, again, I got to like, I almost have to pick either listening to you or reading the comment section. <laughs> now, now I feel like if I chime in, I'm going to completely, you know, because um, I know what the topic was. I just don't know exactly what you said, but certain glues can bridge a gap and certain glues can't. Oh, yeah, we didn't get that involved. I just, I just okay. said that, go, so you go for it. Well, no, I was just, I, I was just going to mention that certain adhesives are meant to bridge a gap. It's like epoxy, for example, is meant to bridge a gap, but CA glue is not. Um, you know, or even like PVA glue, not the necessarily the best at filling voids and bridging gaps. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when people are kind of gluing up in different situations and circumstances to where, uh, CA glue does exceptionally well when two completely almost, you know, flat surfaces are just kind of, you know, there. PVA glue, very similar, but if, if you're trying to fill kind of little cracks and voids and stuff. Um, you might want to look towards an epoxy. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, from a chemical standpoint, in organic chemistry, we study glues and adhesives. And oh, Jyoti's leaving. Bye. <laughs> uh, I'm just. I'm going to go downstairs. Okay. So uh, we study glues and adhesives, and uh, they have two main properties. One is adhesive strength, how well they stick to other things, and one is cohesive strength, how well they stick together. And so the glues that Nick is talking about that that don't bridge gaps, those are glues with poor cohesive strengths. So if you're trying to bridge a gap with PVA or with CA glue, the joint's going to fail. If you bridge that gap with epoxy, it has a much better chance of success. Houston Woodworks uh, Woodworkers said, you went from lab coat to shop apron is straight jacket next. <laughs> <laughs> apron to straight jacket, yep. Maybe, maybe. My cousin... He was going to come over tonight and support me, but he's not here. Huh. It's okay. <laughs> no, that's no, that's not acceptable. No? <laughs> no. We're going to wait. We can't say anything until he gets there. No, he didn't make it, man. We only got 45 minutes left. He's not going to make it, I think. Half the girls left. It's just me and Rupa now. Well, you got the best ones then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, really think about. It. I'm not trying to kiss her butt, but she made the other ones. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, she, she's the one that's really in charge. Yeah. I mean, the bookcase can't be the best. The person that made the bookcase has got to be the best. <laughs> so they're calling him out. They're wanting his phone number. He just chimed in. He said, "I'm here." He's here, as in at home on his computer. He's not over here, <laughs> but he's still listening. That's funny. He says he's on his way. We'll see. We'll see. He got he got called out. <laughs> He said, leaving now. Maybe. We'll see. That's pretty funny. Which one is he? Uh, so he, my cousin, Steven, he's, uh, he's actually going to be in an upcoming video. Uh, I don't think he's commented. He commented last week here, um, but no one's ever seen him in the shop yet. But he, uh, he's helping me with this bed. And so. Yeah, he just commented above you, David. Steven Irvin. Yep, Steven Irvin. Right. Uh-oh. Now, now he's, now he's really going get, to get some crappy comments. Yeah, <laughs> but he's uh so he does he does uh, woodworking on his own a little bit. He does uh, he's also a carpenter. He builds decks, um, uh, homes. He's he's a very accomplished. He's not he's not that old. I, I don't remember how old he is. Maybe close to thirty. But uh, he's been doing uh, working with wood uh, for many many years. So Addy wants to be my apprentice. Man, I have you know I've got five daughters, so I don't have a lot of room for an apprentice. And I think you're on the other side of the world, buddy. 
Yes, Stephen, we're going to be on for a bit yet, and then we'll hang out and chat afterwards. So come uh, over. Pure Bond BB at Home Depot. or P I mean, it says Pure Bond BB at HD. Uh, Pure Bond is not Baltic Birch. Just so I, I've worked with Pure Bond. I don't have it available to me locally. It's a pretty solid plywood. It's a pretty decent plywood, but it's it's not Baltic Birch. J Jason Inns wants to know if this is our full time jobs. Where he's a new sub, so it's my full time job now. Um, I I, uh, I can go back to making money doing chemistry and doing chemistry research if I want, but. I'm really having a blast here. Um, here, I get to have my girls in the shop with me all the time. Uh, my wife films all of our projects, and uh, the rest of us build it. And we're we're having a lot of fun. We just started uh, right at the end of January this year, and I'm having a blast. So I, we're going to keep doing this for as long as we can. I just read a comment from Joe. I'll answer the question first, but <laughs> that comment was pretty funny from Joe. Um, it, it's my it's my main day job, but there's plenty of other things that I do to supplement. I mean, I build props for different theater sets. I build different. I haven't built the whole theater set in a long time. I've helped out on a lot of things. Um, I still do an occasional custom cabinet um, for uh, various cabinet companies that are more or less set up as an assembly line with different variations. And if they order something wildly unique, um, but there's definitely definitely different things I, I do to make ends meet because. Uh, YouTube doesn't pay, you know, enough like at my level, um, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm, that that's all. I mean, it sounds all kumbaya and let's go hug a tree, but I'm happy. I'm uh, doing this, and I've been happier doing this or whatever than I've been in 15 years of my life. So I'm I'm cool with that. Yeah, I yeah, I should definitely point out that YouTube doesn't pay the bills, that's for sure. I, I take in commissions and then I videotape those commissions. Uh, once in a while, I'll take I'll take a uh, projects that my, I have some Patreon people who subscribe to my Patreon channel and they recommend project, or if they wanna see a project and I, I've got time, I've, I'll fit that in as well. Uh, but I basically make money from the commissions and YouTube combined. And it's not, uh, we don't get rich off of it, and I could never have built this woodworking shop from that. I built the most of these tools, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years uh, of doing woodworking, slowly building things, selling them, buying a better tool, things like that. I don't know where, I, I know um, DJ Anakin was saying, wait, Nick Ferry's isn't King's Woodworking. I know that, that he knew that, um, I'm just trying to think of how you set up. You must have set up the live show to where it doesn't show the thumbnail on the bottom. It probably only shows when I'm talking. Oh. So that's why people are like, oh, I didn't even know he was in here. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm very sorry. I should have done that. Hey, I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't watched the live feed. I only popped out the thing, so I have no idea. Well, yeah, everybody, I have to apologize. I am not an expert at setting this up, and I probably messed it up. I should have gotten some advice from Nick before I set this up and, and did it right. But uh, by golly, we'll probably do we'll probably do this again, and uh, we'll get it set up correctly. Oh, it's, he said it's switching now. Were you clicked on your square? Um, I don't – no, I don't think so. We, 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 you're, it's going back and forth, so I'm not sure. Well, there you go. Um, but anyways, DJ Anakin wants to see the Batarang again, James. Oh, oh, okay. It's here. It's very dangerous because it's made of wenge. So you want to be careful when you handle this. Throw it only at your enemies. <laughs> David wants to know what our favorite drinks are. He said, Nick, I take you for a grape soda kind of guy. <laughs> a grape soda guy. What's your favorite one, James? Uh, I don't really have a favorite, I suppose. Um, I, I used to drink uh, – um, Whiskey like uh, Maker's Mark a long time ago. I don't anymore at all. I don't drink at all alcohol anyway. Um, I don't really have a favorite drink. Um, sorry. <laughs> well, I, go, going back real quick to the switching thing. No, there's a, there's a different way of setting up the room. And what I was mentioning was it would show a small little thumbnail to whoever's not speaking on the bottom. And then whoever's speaking would be the big one. It must be set up to where... All you see is who's speaking. Totally fine. I'm just just trying to um, 
clear up some confusion that people are having. But um, Knicks will have an umbrella, whatever it is, Kevin Miller said. Yeah, um, I drink a lot of water, oddly enough. Um, and it doesn't even need to be cold. And my wife, when she drinks water, it needs to be cold. Um, I like beer. I'm a big beer guy. Um, I'm not into a, to a ton of soda or sweets. So if I have a soda, a pop, a Coke, whatever you want to call it, it's kind of – it's got to be something. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'd be something odd. I like I like ginger ale a lot more than probably any other soda. But well, I like root beer. I like I like I like root beer. I like Barks root beer. We call it root beer. Root beer, yeah. Root beer is good too. Yeah. <laughs> no, just, and and by the way, people people often misinterpret me to be kind of an a hole because they're like, wow, you know, that was kind of condescending or rude. No, I was just like when he said root beer, I was like, "Wow, that's a cool way of saying it." And I'm not, I'm not, you know, but it's just root beer here. Anyways, yep, well, I'm used to all kinds of different accents actually. So my wife, my wife's family being from India, they have they have an accent, and uh, my family is from North Carolina, so they all have southern accents. So everybody I know has a different accent than me. Oh, Henry Weinhart's, yeah, Jyoti just pointed it out. That's really good. What is – oh, that's a brand of root beer, huh? Yeah, brand name root beer there. Uh, A&W is good too. I I remember when – we never had a drive-in A&W in town here, at least that I remember, but there was a drive-in A&W when, we when we'd go up north. Um, I'm, I'm trying to help moderate here too. Oh, they handled it already. You deleted it. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. He was responding to my. I I, I sound like an a hole sometimes. Oh, okay. No, I was I, I was clicking show it. Sorry, David. I didn't do it. Blame James. Tell him um, to tell him to post it again. Wait, oh no, it, it really don't matter. <laughs> it's, um, it's over now. Huh? Um. But, oh, but we had a drive-in A and W up north where our, uh, my grandpa's cottage was, and I just remember their onion rings being. This has nothing to do with woodworking, but I just remember, long story short, it was just so much fun to have girls come skate up, deliver food, these crunchy big onion rings, and you got to eat in the car. It's just one of those memories for me from my childhood that I absolutely love. So um, Kevin wants to know how, how I met my wife. Yeah. Uh, we met in the library, um, I think maybe – Sophomore, junior year, junior year, just before my senior. Yeah, year. in the summer, in the summer of uh, junior senior year, <laughs> met in the public library during the summer. Yep, Maya's answering it. My daughters are answering it. Yeah, Jordan, it's, a, it's a super romantic story. I, I just told the whole thing. It's not really that romantic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, David. David was saying now. Now is he he's worried that you you're gonna ban his comment next time. Nope. Yeah, <laughs> there was no moderation on that one. It just came right through. So, <laughs> and the word you're talking about is funny because oh, it just came right through. Yeah, it did. <laughs> just came right out, man. <laughs> you darn waffle stomper. Anyways, um. You better get that right. She's sitting right there. That's right. <laughs> I probably remember better than her. I don't know. No, may maybe not. She gave me a strange look. Yep, libraries are the best pe place to meet your life partner. That could be true. I mean, you could you could meet them in places where less intelligent people hang out. <laughs> oh, she's waving hi. That's <laughs> fired. Huh? You're like, oh, you can meet them where less intelligent people hang out. I mean, that's kind of like shots fired. Oh, I, I guess I didn't mean that. I, I meant to say that if you're in the library, you're probably not completely dumb. That's maybe, maybe even that's the, I shouldn't say that. I don't know. I've, I've not seen a whole lot of intelligent people reading newspapers attached to large sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Do they still have those at the library? I haven't been to a library in a long time. I don't know. I haven't been in a library in a long time either. I feel bad. Library is kind of outdated. You know, I, I do my research online. I've got I have access to um, 
like technical journals and things like that through the college, through the university here. And so I just, if I got to look something up, I, it's much more, much more uh, uh, accurate for me to get it online now. I'm hoping, I'm hoping James didn't read this, but Steve was, uh, it brought up a good point. But James, do you know what a bubbler is? Uh, I do. Well, I, I'm a uh, water fountain, a bubbler. So yeah, just something that aerates. Is that what they're referring to? Yeah. You know, no, Steve, Steve, Steve nailed it. He must be either near Wisconsin. A bubbler is a drinking fountain. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, no, I, we, That's what we call them. We call them bubblers. Oh, nice. Yeah, they. I guess water kind of bubbles out of them. I yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Steve does stuff. Met his wife in the worst place possible: a tech support call center for Dish Network. Why well, that sounds all right. Going going back to the the terminology. When I visited Jay Bates in Mississippi, uh, one of the uh, 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 I think it was a waitress was like, "What kind of coke do you want?" <laughs> and, and I'm like, I don't know regular coke and they're like no like, they, they, that's their word for soda and i'm like I, I, that was total brand new to me so that but i thought it was cool yeah so my family in north carolina they'll call it a soda pop we 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 don't really use that term here too much yeah that kind of go soda here pop here it really don't matter like but around here there's a lot of catholic christians christian catholics that uh, around Lent, can't eat meat, so you go out for a plate of perch and a pop. <laughs> yeah, perch, that's not meat. It's a, a, a fish, or, fish or more or less vegetables. I'm fine with calling them that. Yeah, this, this veered off of the woodworking course a little bit. I guess that's okay. If people are people are listening, that's cool. Well, how many people do you have watching? Uh, 110, 109. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you guys, you could absolutely bring up any anything you want. Um, you know, well, I guess within reason. Um, ask us whatever, or uh, or bring up woodworking questions, whatever you want to do. No, no, no big deal. I, oh, here before before we get too far into this, I meant to do this a long time ago, um, but when we were talking about a woods, exotic woods, or even domestics, I did want to recommend this book. And in case James didn't cover it. I even uh, earmarked a bunch of pages, but this this book is Wood Identifying and Using Hundreds of Woods Worldwide by Eric Meyer. Um, just it's just awesome. Um, they, it, I don't know. Take a look at the book. It gives all the, you know, the jink of hardness and all that stuff, modulus of elasticity, all that good stuff. Um, and sometimes they'll include pictures of it. In fact, this uh, Sebel Siebel. I, I I would say Siebel. Um, I actually had a big chunk of that. That's why I had that one bookmarked. But wow. and, this, and this stuff's heavy too. So I'm. Um, but some, what do they call it too? I'm trying to think of. Um, let's see here. What do they call it? I mean, it's a it's a rosewood, Patagonian rosewood, is is kind of how some people pronounce it. But anyways. That's my recommendation. I will just hold it there for a second. You guys can find it on the Amazonians. That was you, do you have a link to that on, on your on your website or on your on your YouTube channel anywhere? I, I, I don't have that. I've seen it, heard about it. I, I might go buy that. I don't, but let me put a link up in the chat. Um, that's a, I have <laughs> seen that in person, and that's a great book. So I, I'll probably buy that if you put a link in the chat. Yeah, let me – let's see here. I don't know if I bought it off of Amazon or not. And I will copy oh, that. I did, I, I did, I did. Let's see here. Um, I'll copy that link to the description when we're when this is over too. There you go. That's And it's an error. Try again. Edit and try again. Maybe it won't let me, but it, it says I'm a uh, moderator. Can you let that go through? Uh, it never showed up over here. Huh? Let me send it. Let me send it to me on the uh, yeah I will. on the conversation. Let's see here. And it, it, it's an Amazon affiliate link. Maybe that's why it's blocking it. I don't know. 
Okay, yeah. So it's an Amazon affiliate link. If anybody goes and, and buys this, um, I think Amazon sends a very tiny percentage uh, to Nick, which is cool. That helps support his channel. Uh, but it's a good book. I will actually go and buy it, and I will actually use the uh, that affiliate link. Um, oh, I can't seem to paste it. Um, that's pretty strange. Well, here, let me let me see if I can – let me see if I can log into something different. I, I just signed up for that influencer thing. Okay. Um, let's let's see if I can log into that. So, I mean, I, I'm not trying to get the 6% or 5% that you get on some of this stuff, but um, that's how I grab links. It's just easier for me to do that. Right. And, of course, let's see. I'm trying to put in my, uh, if you go to amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Nick Ferry, that's what I'm trying to put it and put it in there. But this is just becoming kind of a mess. <laughs> there I put, a, I think that hopefully that might work. Oh, I did find it. Oh, man. Add to list. All right. I will try a new one. I got it, Nick. I got it. It's there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. okay, so every, the link is there. If anybody wants it, I mean, buy, you know, you don't have to go buy it, obviously, but if anybody's interested... It's there. It's a good book. Uh, the, the second one I put up should work. Yeah, you got it. So, I only have my table saw. I mean, I literally just signed up for this program two days ago. So I literally have my table saw and now that wood book. So that, that's what you guys are getting. Nice. Go to that link. But um, No, I like it because not only that, but I'm probably the worst for identifying wood. And um, James is phenomenal at identifying wood. I don't know why I had – oh, I had yellow heart. But they have – one of the better ways to identify wood is magnified uh, versions of the end grain. That's actually one of the better ways to identify wood. And so that's why I like the book versus, you know, uh, going online and trying to look for this stuff. You, you Just in print, you can kind of hold it up to the wood and stuff like that. I like it. It's one of those – if anyone's a Seinfeld fan, this would be a flagged book. So it seems like people are finding uh, that the link works, but that book is not currently available. So, well, I'll do some research <laughs> and see if we can find it somewhere and, and put a link in the description in case anybody is interested. Yeah, no worries. I mean, at least it gives you that. I'm not after the 6%. You know, if you guys, at least now you know the title and the author. And if you do decide to buy the book, throw out, hey, I saw this on James's channel when, and, you know, Nick was talking about it, whatever. I'm sure the author would like to hear that, you know, because, I mean, he's, he's not like a Stephen King-type author, you know. Yep. All right, so let's get back to some questions here. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Thoughts on using a router table to make 45-degree miters for making boxes? Hmm. Personally, I would do it on the table saw. Uh, I, I, anything I can cut on the table saw, I will before I go to my router table. I, I would agree with that hundred percent, but I understand the basis of the question and the basis of the question probably is rooted in, you can't get that blade 100% 45 or whatever you're feeding. If you're doing a bevel, um, I'm not a fan of, if you can't get it to work, try something easier. I'm more of a fan of get it to work, get that 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 skill set down, because that's going to be your foundation for building a million other projects. Right. Because there's going to be instances where you can't use your router table. All right. So Steve does stuff. Uh, no, yeah, Steve does stuff. Uh, I lost the question. Somebody want? <laughs> I'll get back to that, Steve. Somebody want to know what our current projects are? Earlier on in the show, we mentioned it. We probably have a new set of viewers now. Uh, my current project that we're working on, we're just about to finish with, is a queen size 
sleigh bed. It's made of red oak. It was for a client who was looking for uh, uh, an antique one, actually, but she needs the bed to be queen size, and she couldn't find that in an antique, and so she commissioned us to build it for her in queen size. So she brought us pictures. We designed it. Um, my daughter, Sai, actually designed it in uh, uh, SketchUp. Well, my design, her, her, her SketchUp drawing, and we, uh, we are building that for her. And I guess the another thing I'm working on is this. I'm building a desk. Uh-oh. Hang on. Sorry about that. There we go. I am building a lap desk for my wife. It's going to be bird's eye maple, and it's got a strip of cocobolo and ebony in it there. They kind of blend together with a, with a, a long angle cut, and that's, that's a lap desk. That's what we're working on currently. Um, I was the most recent thing I was messing around with was a fancy push stick out of walnut and bird's eye maple. Um, working on that, I just did the the mortise and the tenon last night, and I'm adding some more things to it. James is trying to talk me out of it, but I, I think I'm I think I'm going to send this one to James, and we're going to trade. He's going to give me one of the mallets, and I'm hoping it's one of them uh, lignum vitae mallets, but. Um, that's what I was. I mean, I got, I got benches I'm working on, a table saw uh, fixture that I'm, or a table saw sled fixture that I'm working on, a pine box, not you know one that goes six feet under the ground, but just a pine chest, I guess. Uh, what else? I don't know. I like having fun in the shop, basically. Uh, Jason Inns wants to know: Is Powermatic the best machines for home shop equipment? Um, I don't know. I've never used Powermatic. I, I don't think that they necessarily are the best um, uh, for home shop. You know, you don't you don't have to buy the best um, because no matter what you buy, there's always one better. Uh, there's positively stuff that's better than Powermatic, um, but there's positively woodworkers who build stuff far better than I ever could with uh, with machinery that cost a small fraction of mine. You can make you can you can you can build anything you want. It just you know with what you have usually. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know about Powermatic. I think it's a, probably a fine tool, uh, but I, as far as it being the best, I wouldn't think so. Again, that's kind of a subjective, relative question. Um, Powermatic is a high quality tool. Uh, if somebody is is looking at getting their hands on and getting some time behind tools, one of the things that I do in my spare time is work for different theater groups. And that's a good place to start because different theater groups have different power tools. And, and if you're doing, say, community theater or if you're doing theater for, like, say, a high school, you know, they have shop classes and, you know, you can go on all sorts of different, you know, power equipment, whether it's Powermatic, the Delta Unisaw, the Saw Stop, stuff like that. And you can kind of try things out as you go. Powermatic is definitely a high quality tool. Is it the perfect, quote unquote, perfect, you know, equipment for a home shop? No, there, there really is none. I mean, because that's subjective. And that's different to each and every person that's, you know, out in their shop. Uh, for years and years, I did fine on a contractor, a craftsman, aluminum top table saw. Cool. Uh, Didi wants to know, uh, wants to talk about finishing types, what we use and what we don't. I, I don't use, I have in, over my lifetime of woodworking, I have used a great many types of finishes. I've used uh, polyurethanes, water-based, oil-based. Um, I've used lots of oil finishes, things like that. My favorite finish, hands down, is lacquer. I like. Uh, I use a lot of um, lacquer made by a company called Deft. D E F T. They make a clear uh, lacquer. It's great. It's uh, it is solvent-based. So if you use lacquer, you're going to need to wear a respirator. Uh, lacquer is very bad for you. It can actually cause brain damage if you don't wear a respirator when you spray it. Uh, but I like it. It's quick and easy. You spray it on. In five minutes, it's ready for a recoat. If you mess the lacquer up, the lacquer can be um, uh, sanded down and, and, and fixed very, very easily. So that's sort of my go-to finish uh, for a lot of the projects that I build. So my cousin's here. I'm going to introduce you to my cousin. He's helping me build the bed. This is Steven. Oh, he's, he's wearing his fancy King's Fine Woodworking sticker. So... <laughs> So Jason lo likes lacquer. I, I love lacquer as well. You can pull up a chair there, Stephen. Uh, let's see. What else? What else? Well, people are still talking about the jet and the saw stop and things like that. So, you know, I, I, I don't own a saw stop. 
Um, saw stop doesn't really make um, a lot of industrial grade stuff. I have a 12 inch table saw. The biggest they make is a 10, although it is pretty high powered. So Steven's a new photo bomber right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna sit right back here. There mm -hmm. we go. So yeah, so I, I don't know that I would buy a saw stop. I, saw stop. I like the idea that um, it'll stop if you get your finger in the blade. That's great. I have five daughters who like to do woodworking, so we may look into that at some point. Um, but right now, I don't. Uh, I don't own one. So let's see. Hello, Steven. That's Maya. Maya saying hi to you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> What's the benefit of a lacquer or catalyzed lacquer? Okay, so you can buy lacquer finishes in in catalyzed, pre-catalyzed, uh, uh, or or you know where where it happens, or you or it, or that occurs after the fact. I don't know that there's a benefit. I think if uh, you buy the kind that uh, will cure under heat or UV, if you live if you work in a commercial shop, then you have sort of an instantaneous cure and you can move on uh, faster. I think those finishes might be a tiny bit harder. So Cy had to photobomb because Stephen photobombed. I don't know if you saw that or not. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get photobombed so much we can't answer can't answer any questions. <laughs> so Joe says he's half polished. So. He can't polish, polish. Yeah, I can't read either. I'm thinking about polish. So he can't afford to lose any more brain cells. Yeah, well, I don't know about that, man. Some, somebody earlier, and I, I had to step out for a second, but somebody earlier said, what's the best finish or preferred finish for end grain cutting boards? Oh, okay. So, well, you know, we talked about that too earlier. I think uh, uh, um, food grade um, mineral oil is really very good. A lot of people use food grade mineral oil uh, with beeswax uh, melted together, and that also works great. Uh, of course, cutting board and wood, that, if there's nothing wrong with it, you will need to periodically upkeep the finish on that. Uh, and what do you use for, for in grain cutting boards, Nick? Well, we talked about food safe finishes earlier. We didn't necessarily talk specifically to in grain cutting boards, so my answer is actually a little bit different than what we talked about earlier. But uh, I, I dig mineral oil for end grain cutting boards for a fair amount. Whoa, for a fair amount of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is end grain is the capillary action of end grain. It's, it, it absorbs. It just sucks up finish. So with mineral oil, it's a real quick touch up. If you don't want to submerge an end grain cutting board in like hot soapy water and then leave it there, um, but if it's if it's a well maintained cutting board, you should basically be able to kind of wipe the food stuffs off of it, a uh, little bit of detergent and water, and then and then dry it. But dry it with a towel and then set it off to dry. Don't set it off, you know, soaking wet. And I have a little jar of mineral oil in my kitchen. And, you know, it's just, you know, if it's dry and it's been drying there for a while, just if it absorbs some mineral oil, you know, wipe it on, let it absorb, then wipe it off. Um, as far as food safe finishes, I'm of the camp where as soon as they all cure, as soon as all the finishes cure, I have no problem putting on whether it's a, a shellac or a lacquer, so long as you're not sitting there eating the flakes. Um, and even then, as James pointed out earlier, it's, you know, it's essentially a plastic at that point, and all the, uh, the solvents, the carriers, have evaporated, flashed off, so it's not toxic. It's just not maybe pleasing to your palate. Yep, that's that's right. Um, yeah, they would be inert; they wouldn't react with you. So let's see. Uh oh, Joe's gonna Joe's gonna get somebody in trouble. The best finisher for ingrain sanding and finishing is to have your wife do the sanding and finishing. <laughs> but if anybody does the sanding and finishing other than me, that's fine. Well, I want to do the finishing. Yeah, I, I like that that part, but I don't like the sanding part. David says lacquer will make you retarded if you sniff enough. <laughs> David is David is correct. <laughs> I see Nick laughing over there. David is correct. Believe it. Believe it. Yeah. Do not do not spray lacquer in your shop without a respirator. And and if you can, I mean, people talk about that. Oh, you have proper ventilation. Well, yeah, if you can, I mean, it's a solvent. And in, and James has mentioned uh, methyl ethyl ketone a few times. M E K. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty harsh one. Acetone's a pretty harsh one, uh, as well as lacquer. So if if you're um, you know, around the winter months where, you know, I live in northeast Wisconsin, so it's it's cold. Well, last night, I think it got to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if I'm finishing stuff and I have to keep the doors closed because I, I want to keep the heat that I paid to, you know, produce, I use a lot of wipe-on polyurethanes in, in the colder months, but I'm definitely a fan of lacquer when I can open the door and ventilate. 
So Barbara wants to know about a shooting board for perfect miter. You probably got have more experience in that department than me. I've never used a shooting board. Yeah, shooting boards are nice, and and for the perfect miter, yes. And if you're doing a ton of picture frames, I've never owned one, but I've used one like a guillotine style cutter to get a real clean, crisp. You're severing those fibers. Um, now, a shameless plug on my table saw sled, and James's does this too, where you can get 45s on that. Shooting boards are nice, and, and you, you can do all that stuff, but you have to end up with at least two pairs of those four sides equal length. So if you're doing a shooting board, you might have a perfect tear-out free, completely glass-like surface, but if, if it's parallel brother on the, in the picture frame is not the identical length, it doesn't matter what your angles are at because it, it's not going to come together. So if you, as long as you think of that in conjunction with having at least two pairs of equal length, if not all four being equal length, getting a square. But Yeah, and I think we can conclusively say if you want to make a picture frame, um, you really have no choice but to make either Nick's or, or my sled. Um, that's the only way to get a perfect picture frame. So I'm kidding, obviously. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm serious. I don't know. Well, one, one of the theater groups that I do work for is in a high school, and they have that guillotine-style cutter. Uh, if you look up picture guillotine-style cutter, I mean, it'll come up. Again, if, if that's what you're doing, those things work phenomenally. Um, and it's, it's the same premise as a shooting board. The only shooting board I have in my shop right now is a 90 degree shooting board just because I don't, I don't feel like I would grab a 45 shooting board enough, or I don't even have an insert that would go on a 90 degree shooting board, you know? So, so Joe says, check out my YouTube for a great miter sled. And, uh, in truth, uh, uh Nix is the number one, uh, cross cut and miter sled on YouTube. So, Certainly check mine out, but don't do that unless you check out his. He's definitely got the by far the best ones there, and I had a look at his plans. Uh, they're spectacular. They're better than mine, uh, so I'm going to have to make mine a little bit better. But uh, but yeah, definitely check out check out his as well. I, I lucked out with that video. That was uh, a sled that I had designed and I had wanted to build for years and years, uh, and I the, the YouTube gods were smiling that day, and that's the number one video on my channel. Uh, which is humbling and it's just awesome. There's other videos that I thought were actually like cooler projects, but I'll hey take the good, take the bad. How does the rest of the song go? <laughs> uh oh, is it almost singing time? Yeah. So <laughs> Richard Willett says it's called a lion trimmer. That's right, Richard. It's called a lion miter trimmer. I've seen those in action. They're they're pretty amazing. I've never used one, but they they're awesome. Nick does. Oh, uh, never mind. Let's see. Oh, Jyoti's talking about migraines. Well, he was saying, does it have a spot for a splitter, like a riving knife? Yeah, it, it, it does. Okay. These these are scrolling by so fast I can't see them, but right, right, right. Mine does not have that, really. And mine also, um, your bolts, the way you have your for your T-bolts, they come out. I leave mine permanently in there. So yours is definitely a little bit better there for that. Well, my, mine can come out, but I actually leave mine permanently in uh, Yeah. See, okay, this is how messy my shop is, though. So if I go to try and show, let's see. My, miter, my miter sled is under there somewhere, uh, but the bolts just reside on the other side typically. That's you know, it's just where I put them. So. Yep, that's that's cool. I leave mine on there at all times because I don't have a choice. So uh, uh, Dave, Dave let us know he had to leave, and now he's back. I just thought I'd inform everybody. Jason wants to know any thoughts on the wedgie board sled style, the wedgie sled. I have a video coming out where it's it'll perform the same task. It's probably not as nice as a dedicated wedgie sled, but I've had a multitude of segmented turners ask me what I do. In fact, I, I can grab it. It's actually very, very simple, um, but this is what I use to get angled cuts on my table saw sled. That video should be coming out um, at some point. Um, I wish I had better information there, but. Kev Kevin wants to know, James, is the handle still on the taper jig? Uh, yeah, it is. I never took it off. 
yeah, so I built this tapering jig. I needed one, and uh, I, I went and bought a handle and put a handle on the tapering jig, and I never used it. I just held the tapering jig and the, and, the, and the board and pushed it through and made a bunch of cuts like that. Every time I use it, I, I don't use the handle. So I was complaining about having had to buy it for no reason. So, yeah, it's still there. I should take it off and send it to you, Kevin. Maybe you need it. David asks how, how I function like that. Easily. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a multitude of projects and it just, that's just how I work. Um, I've always thought, at least in my brain and in, in the processes that make me think, uh, if you have time to put away each and every single tool after you touch it and use it for one particular task, you're kind of muting your imagination almost. Uh, if, oh man, I want to go out and build and then you set the tools down and you're just, you know, oh man, I don't know. If you're going, hold on, hold on, I did this procedure. Let me go put it. That to me, that kills the the pace of your fun and imagination. You're getting that echo again. If you want to mute, unmute. Okay. Hopefully not, that, that's better. Hopefully. No, it's still there. But still there. Your, 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 I'm not. I'm not trying to sound demanding. I just. I'm just letting you know it's there. It's up to you whether you want to. Okay, hopefully hopefully that's better. Nicholas uh, Palazzo, Palato, sorry if I butchered that. If you can't afford a Festool Domino, have you ever thought of making one out of a small router? Hmm, that's sort of what the Panto router does, I suppose. Tyler G, um, a friend of mine, YouTube channel. If you look up Tyler G, a domino maybe um, I don't have a direct link to the video he had something similar to it Izzy Swan had something similar to that um, I, I don't make a ton of tools I, I, I typically don't but yeah so I just wanted to mention for everybody who's tuning in now if you missed anything earlier when we <clears throat> talked about all the exotic woods. This video will be saved and permanently on my channel. Uh, so you can go back and review that. And uh, the spreadsheet that I created for uh, talking about all the various exotic woods, uh, the properties of the exotic woods, where you get them, where they're from, uh, how much they cost, things like that, that that's available. Um, there's a link in the description. It's on my website for free. You can download that if you're interested in, in looking at that. And if you anybody wants a sticker, I have stickers back in stock. Uh, just send uh, uh, send me your address, and I'll send you a sticker, uh, no charge. Um, anywhere in the world, I'll, I'll send you a sticker if you're interested. And if you, if you didn't get questions answered during the during the show here, uh, just let me know and or leave a comment because this will be up, and we'll uh, make a point to go back through and answer all of the questions that come in after the fact. And so Nick is taking a break. It looks like. Uh, let's see. No, he's not. On the Cincinnati Rex hat that he gave me. <laughs> so I, I had to grab it quick. So there. Is that better? <laughs> oh, nice. There you go. Yeah. All right, so Creep Factor, he's building a shop in his garage. Do either of us have suggestions for handicap accessibility with any stations against the walls? That's a good one. Um, you know, you could uh, for sure... I know people have done miter stations. Instead of putting cabinets beneath them, uh, they leave it open, and they and they can't deliver the table off the wall, so that you can get. If you're in a wheelchair, for example, you can get underneath uh, underneath the the table uh, or the countertop of your of your miter station and access that. I'm not sure if I have any other ideas. One one that I've seen, and it, and it's and it's always kind of had the wheels going in my head over it, and I want to get I want to get the brand right, but. I think it was Nova has special um, legs to go with one of their lathes, and it's kind of a slanted A-frame, and it puts the the bed of the lathe, the bed rails, out and in front of the user, so where if you have a wheelchair, you can get right up to spindle turning, bolt turning, everything. I'm 95% sure that that was um, – See, now I'm drawing a blank. What did I say what brand that was? Nova. Nova. I'm pretty sure that was the one that they had. 
But then also any type of, I mean, even scroll sawyers like to have their kind of their benches. A lot of the guys that I know, they like, to, you know, whatever scroll saw it is, tilt it towards the user. So it's it, rather than having to kind of hunch over, and if I turn this way, kind of do one of these deals, the, the work is more in front of you. Uh, I could see that to be very wheelchair friendly. So basically getting any tool kind of tilted and out. Um, yeah, especially if it's a, against the wall. I could even see, you might need a little bit of help with it, but like a benchtop bandsaw. Because even my Rikon um, has four bolt holes and a fairly substantial base. And I could even see that being safe up to about maybe 10 degrees of tilt. And if you cantilever that off, I would imagine if you you know do all the measurements right, you can get the the wheelchair underneath there. Yeah, his name was Mike. His uh, his uh, YouTube username is Creep Factor, but his name is Mike. Thanks for commenting, Mike. Uh, Barbara says that shellac is in many foods and meds. That's exactly right. Uh, shellac is a, is a natural organic product. It's not product. It's not a synthetic product. Uh, it comes from the lac beetle, which is harvested. Um, but yeah, you're right. Essentially excrement. <laughs> <laughs> Counterweight. So yeah, yeah I bet I, there's got to be plenty of stuff for uh, for some uh, woodworkers in wheelchairs. I would imagine. Yeah. I would say I would say some sort of positive stop to um, your tools, maybe bigger, bigger paddle switches, or at least having paddle switches and, and uh, emergency stops because, uh, your mobility might be, you know, if you're, if you get say a kickback or something to where, um, if you're not in a wheelchair, maybe you can jump out of the way or move or get out of the danger zone. You might not be able to do that so quick. So that's another maybe safety thing. And by the way, I'm totally shooting from the hip here. I have no idea. Um, but it just seems like that would be a, so long as there's a big thing, you know, emergency stop, because you can't like you immediately jerk your hands away, but then you have to wheel out of the way, which would probably take longer than somebody's immediate reaction to kind of get out of the way if something were to go awry. And Joe says it's beetle puke. Thanks, Joe. That's just what we needed. <laughs> So David, custom-made tools wouldn't be cheap, but are very talented fabricators out there. I don't know what that means. Oh, cut. oh right, have, have something custom-made, sure. Well, cool. So it is, we still have 92 viewers on listening at this moment. Um, I'll leave it up to Nick and everybody else out there. Nick's sled is epic, according to Barbara. Thank you. Um, I'll leave it up to Nick and the viewers if we, we can go for a little bit longer if everybody wants or has questions or we can wrap it up. It's up to it's up to you guys. So um, chime in. Yeah. Are you still going to do one of those like after it's done live maybe invite folks back to the hangout? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. We can we we can wrap up and uh well, No, I'm not saying no, no. I don't want to quit the show. I'm just saying uh, anyone that might want to hang out later, just kind of if, if you're kind of on the fence of going to bed or, you know, what I don't know, you know what people do. but Yeah, we'll hang out. We'll hang out for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to put a link up. And uh, anybody who's uh, chatting to the very end, we'll see the link, and you can uh, you can join us in a, in a private chat afterwards. It won't be on air on YouTube, and so you can call Nick whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> and now keep in mind, though, uh, there's two people in the room, James and myself, there's only there's a limit of ten, so eventually I think what James did last time was posted a link to hop in this room after it's live on YouTube, but it's essentially the first eight people, and if you're really wanting to get in, and it says full, check back in ten minutes. Sometimes people pop in for five minutes and just want to say hi. Right. Yeah. People will pop in and out. Last time's James. Last time James popped out because my internet failed. Yeah. Well, there you go, uh, James. Uh, Kevin's asking, uh, what is cellulose uh, sanding sealer versus shellac based? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Unless it's made of cellulose, I suppose that's a possibility. If, if that's true, that might uh, help with, uh, with UV uh, protection because cellulose, of course, uh, does not oxidize. But 
I, I, I actually I can't I can't answer that thir fully because I don't know. I'm sorry. Well, there you go. I, I don't know the, the cellulose sanding sealer. I'm I'm not super familiar with unless I use it and I just don't know the, the you know the actual base root there. But shellac based, yeah. I mean, it's just a, a lighter cut of shellac as a sanding sealer just to stop the absorption rate of whether it's dyes, ink, stains, stuff like that, uh, or just to raise the grain. Raise you know. A sanding sealer. Yeah. So someone from Mac, Mac Tech wants to know if I have turned any balsa wood or basswood nose cones. No, I haven't actually. You know, I've always kept my rocketry separate from uh, from my woodworking for some reason, but uh, I've never turned any. But I think I'll give it a try now that you've suggested it. Um, I imagine basswood would turn really nicely. It seems to me like balsa would tear. Uh, you know, unless I got a denser grade of balsa, feels like it would tear. And if you got a catch with balsa wood, I think it would just blow up. Yeah, it'd be gone. But, you know, balsa comes in a great variety of densities. You have to pay a whole lot to get the very lightweight stuff. The, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm new to turning uh, in a sense where I've only had my lathe probably a year, maybe a little bit more. But I've turned plenty of things in my life, but mostly in foam. Um, extruded polystyrene most of the time. And for theater stuff, because it's got to be lightweight, and it doesn't matter if it's truly wood, because you're going to paint it anyways. But the problem with, you know, it, it's nice turning foam, but there's no technique involved. So you can learn a lot of bad habits, because you don't have to, you know, cut it in a certain technique. It just kind of melts away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't melt. It doesn't heat up. I don't want to. Uh, but, I mean, it carves super nice. Yeah, maybe if you're d turning uh, balsa, you could just put uh... – 60 grit sandpaper on a block and and uh, sand it to that diameter pretty quickly sand it into a cone yeah and i've and i've used a sure form on the lathe with foam and you can hog away material too but huh yeah so my my cousin and his family they they owned a, a haunted house and a big giant scale production of actually a bunch of them in colorado and in mexico new mexico you can scoot forward here and they um <laughs> They did a lot of things with foam too, kind of like the set building that you've done, Nick, um, with with big structures, 20, 30 feet tall, out of, also out of the expanded polystyrene foam, EPS foam, mm -hmm. and they used like a hot wire to cut it, and and they made a lot of a lot of things with that. Did a lot of set building, so yeah, that's pretty cool stuff to work with. David says we can just use a soup spoon to turn balsa. That's cool. It probably could actually. <laughs> Have you metal spun? I don't know what that means, but I do have a metal lathe and I have turned metal. Uh, I've done some metal spinning. It's actually a lot of fun, but it is a way steeper learning curve than, than what you think. And it's basically where you start out with a metal disc, typically a non-ferrous metal like uh, brass, aluminum, and then a form, and the tools are almost like a, like a burnishing tool. It's just very smooth. And you can actually uh, manipulate the metal to be, you know, a lot of times with bells, uh, vases, stuff like that. I've done it a few times with mixed results, but a blast because the learning curve is there and just the manipulation of the metal is a whole lot of fun. Yeah, now it rings a bell. I, 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 I've seen people on YouTube, I think, uh, making like pots out of it. You know, they, 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 they form the lids of pots or... Or the or or the base of uh, of uh, big cooking pots with it. That's that is pretty cool. Uh, metal spinning to me is uh, closely attributed to uh, vacuum forming, which I've done a little bit of. But it's a lot more of an artistry than a science. It's made it's backed in science, but it's just you know if you can get these things to do that, it's it's a lot more artistry than it is uh, you know step by step instructions. There's a finesse to it. Oh, Frostlight just gave us a $10 super chat. Thank you very much. That's the second one from Frostlight. Oh, oh you got to be kidding me. Thank you. That, that's awesome. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm glad to see Frostlight. I got your back. <laughs> Nick is paying attention right on. Very nice. Mostly because I, I thought of it as a frosty light beer. but. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you got to go to bed now. Thank you very much for, for tuning in and take care. Let me know if, you, if there's anything you need to see in particular. Awesome.
all the hollow brass from India is spun metal. Hmm. The funny thing is I've seen giant like 20, 30 quart stock pots for cooking. Uh, and normally factories will extrude that with big hydraulic, you know, 30 ton presses. But I've seen people do very similar forms on spun metal. And a lot of times it is kind of in, I wouldn't say third world countries, but places that, you know, they don't have $150,000 for a 20 ton press or a hundred ton press to extrude it. Or I shouldn't say extrude it. It's probably not the right word, but anyways, people kind of, people get it. Yeah. <laughs> KSFWG, you're funny. Uh, Nick, how often do you use your benchtop mortiser? I used I used it the other day. I don't know. If I used it yesterday when I was doing mortises for this overly elaborate. And no, no, that's a good fit um, to do the mortise on this push block. That's a bird's eye maple and walnut push block. Um, that's my push block. People don't get any ideas. <laughs> I, I, chances are I'm going to send this to James because we were we were talking. He was good, we were in trade. I was going to send him this for a mallet. Um, but I, I when I when I did craft shows and when I did a lot of commission stuff, a lot of it was arts and crafts mission style. If you're familiar with that type of furniture, uh, a lot of straight lines, a lot of mortise and tenon, headboards, footboards, end tables. You know, a simple end table could have forty mortises, and so I, I use it. Actually, I've gotten my, my use out of it, and I, I use it as much as I can. So someone uh, is noticing that you're frequently changing your hat. I only changed it once for Kevin. Once in a while, I'll take it off and put it back on just kind of a – but I changed it once for Kevin. Kevin Miller was the one that gave me – and this, now it went – he gave me this because he's from Cincinnati. And by the way, Kevin Miller has actually probably cost me more money than anything. Because he's from Cincinnati, Cincinnati, he brought me a Cincinnati chili mix, and when I made it, I was like, "This is the best chili I've ever had." So now I have an Amazon reoccurring thing for Skyline chili mix and their hot sauce, and I make it at least once a month. So thanks, Kevin. It, it's awesome chili. But yeah, I, I was wearing that because, and Kevin gave me as well. When he came to visit um, a five ace bowl gouge, Carter and Son, he gave me the tool, and then I did the East Indian rosewood handle for it. So yeah, and this is by by far my favorite lathe tool. Um, not only because of the swept back grind, but the metal in this thing is just man, the the crystal structure of this metal is just it gets so much sharper than the other stuff I have. So Nicholas wants to know, uh, I have a 12-inch table saw. Is there a reason for it? why I bought that versus the 10? And do I do uh, larger wood uh, enough to justify 12-inch? I got the 12-inch for a few reasons. One was because it had a much bigger tabletop. You can see it right behind me. Um, but the, the tabletop and the side feed table together are 8 feet. And then from the saw back to the end of the outfeed, that's also 8 feet. I cut a lot of plywood, so, that's, so I needed the bigger tabletop. Uh, but in fact, I also do a lot of cutting with my uh, crosscut sled and with my tapering jig. And if I'm cutting legs, for example, um, for a shaker table and they're three inch legs and I've got my tapering jig, then I, I, you know, I really need a blade that goes up pretty high. And there wasn't a whole lot more money for me to go with a 12 inch versus a 10. And so I went ahead and went for it and I'm happy that I did. Uh, it seems to be built a little bit better, a little more heavier duty. It's the Grizzly Industrial or Extreme Series. Uh, so there's a few reasons why I bought it. I, I certainly think you can get by uh, with uh, any uh, any 10 inch, any good quality 10 inch saw. Um, I just I have the 12 because I wanted the bigger capacity. Do you think? Um, and this, it, my question to James: Do you think with the kinetic energy and everything? Uh, the, the the weight differentiation between a 12 inch and a 10 inch blade. Do you think that it has that momentum to maybe hog through stuff, even if you're only making a three quarter inch cut? Do you think that makes a difference? I don't know. I'm 
I don't really, I don't sense a huge difference. Are you talking about the, the like the kinetic energy from the like the momentum from the mass of the blade being larger? Yeah. I don't really know. I think that's probably, if I had to speculate, I would think the 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 power of the motor plays a much bigger impact than the momentum of the blade. Um, I don't know. It's a it's a good question, but I, I don't know. I think I, yeah, the motors probably plays a bigger role. Yeah, I would imagine it's um, maybe not immeasurable, but it, uh, to the human, probably undetectable. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty remarkable that saw when it's tuned up and uh, it's a big motor. It's a five horsepower motor on there. When it's tuned up and the uh, and the fence is parallel, I can you know I, I cut uh, five inch oak. Um, I have a block somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I cut. Uh, uh, for this bed frame that I or this bed that I'm making, I, I had oak, uh, five six foot long piece that was five inch by five inch. I had glued up, and I put that on the saw, and I just it plowed eight right through it like it was nothing. So I almost couldn't bog it down. You know, maybe maybe because it maybe the momentum helped out there a little bit. I'm not sure, but this is this is the stuff that I that I was cutting. This is uh, about five inches by five inches, and this thing was. It's a, a, an off cut from it, but it was six feet long, and I just one pass right through the blade, six feet long and effortless. And oak is a pretty tough wood to cut, you know, to rip a big, thick quantity of red oak. Yeah. Uh, William, William Stromberg says also plus the, the rotating mass of the rotor and the motor. Um, yeah, like the um, – Well, the motor the motor's on a belt – um, although I, I guess it probably wouldn't slip. So yeah, the rotating mass of, of the motor would assist, I suppose. Yeah. And, and the arbor is pretty heavy. So it's probably, probably true. Probably a bunch, a bunch of stuff happening there. And, and Joe was saying the trunnions he's thinking are larger as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to think exactly the saw my friend Bob here in town has. Um, I want to say it was a 16 inch and he just sold it. He's had it for years and years. Um, but he, he got offered a, a, a decent amount to where he wanted to get rid of it. But, uh, it, he's, he was saying it sounded like a jet engine, you know, when it starts up, I mean, you're moving a lot of air. I mean, that's a lot of gullet space that's displacing that. And it's just whipping through. Of course, it's going to sound substantially loud, louder, but. Yeah, that's for sure. So I want to say hi to Big Screen Bird here. He's on uh, on in the comment section. He actually built a, a Thor's mallet as well on his channel, and it's very cool. Big Screen Bird is his name there. He's uh, he comments pretty regularly on my stuff. Real nice guy. That's did, awesome. Did a pretty good job on his uh, on his build. Yeah, gonna... six, sixteen inches crazy. That is a crazy saw size. I wish I had a 16-inch jointer. <laughs> Barbara, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I hate to buy the 16-inch blades. Oh, let's see here. Anyone else? I'm just trying to think. Ryan wants a drum sander. Me too, Ryan. If you can call Grizzly and get him to donate two of them to you, I'll take one. I'll take any drum sander if it's free, actually. Unless I have to talk about it online, then probably not, but... <laughs> So Big Screen Bird's talking about some maker space. There's a, there, yeah, depending on what town you live in, there are a lot of places that have maker spaces. That might be a good place to go and try out tools if you don't have, if you don't have certain tools or if you don't have tools at all, you can maybe go go to a maker space and get some stuff done. I, I that's that whole concept is kind of new to me when I joined the this local group called Denver Makers. I found out about some maker spaces that were uh, in our town, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, they, 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 that is Dave, right, with KSFWG? Yep. Okay. He'd hate to have to pick up the 16-inch blade. Buying it would be a problem, too. Uh, but my 12-inch blade costs a whole lot more than a 10-inch blade. I had to get a special blade to cut uh, some veneer, and about 250 bucks a blade. So they're more money, that's for sure. Uh, make it rain, a $5 super chat. Thank you very much. That's very much appreciated. 
and so literal, make it rain. Make it rain. You just made it rain, buddy. <laughs> um, and, and by the way, KSFWG stands for Kansas Fun With Guns. Fun With Guns. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Dave's a really good dude. He's got a quite an extensive 1911 uh, collection, and a couple of them he's made grips for and stuff. And just like the, the wood – and I understand that guns are like a hot topic as far as politically, but some of what, you know, a lot of times they call it furniture on guns, stocks and grips and also, man, they use some awesome wood, some walnut burl and just, you know, all sorts of just really cool wood. And um, so sometimes if you're a woodworker and you don't like guns, you can still kind of appreciate the woodworking behind some of the furniture these guys make custom engraved stuff into wood oh it's just yeah that would be a good application for some of the more expensive exotics probably something where it wouldn't take a ton of a ton of material well in fact like this was a lathe tool i was working on i didn't end up liking the profile um but this was out of a uh, walnut gun stock reject um mm. and it was it just gorgeous wood um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just one of those things to where, I don't know. I think there was like a, a almost like a misnomer years ago about you don't restore guns, you might clean them. Um, but now there, there seems to be this surgence of, you know, you can change the wood on some, some of the older antique guns. And I don't know, some of the in, engraving into the metal, engraving in the woodwork into firearms, you know, just beautiful stuff. Yep. Rian Oliver, he does not like guns. I, I don't even own any, but uh, I guess everybody definitely, there will, there will be some strong opinions on guns for sure. I don't go to get into anything anything uh, like that in discussion uh, or, or politics either, for that matter, or religion, how much I Yeah. So kind of I'll try to avoid those on my, my uh, Facebook page too there. Let's see. How about laser beams? Laser beams, pew pew. Pew pew. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go about making deeper picture frames? My in-laws had us make uh, had a picture frame made for us that has about a 1.5 inch backer. So I'm not real sure what you're talking about. You're talking about like a shadow box picture frame? I, I I built a shadow box picture frame on my channel. That was like two projects ago. I'm not sure what they're referring to there exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you look at James's channel, and and there's a, probably a little search thing, shadow box, and I'm sure it would come up. Um, same thing on my channel. I built a shadow box that was an inch and a quarter deep. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking that's what he means. I'm thinking that he, he means shadow boxes. Yeah, probably. But when I build those, I, 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 uh, I just put together a frame and uh, – I um, used dovetail joints to hold it, and then I put three-quarter inch picture frame on the front of it and bonded it together. So, but yeah, check out check out Nick's video. Check out my video. That's a, a good place to start. Um, one here, I'll, I'll show this just because I have the stock sitting here. Uh, oh, I gotta grab the other piece that fell over. Um, but picture frames with. All right, I had the right piece in the in the first place. Lovely, um, but a simple bevel on this picture frame that I'm working on, and I got to tilt it just so you can see the the shadow on the bevel. But but then also a half round piece that I'm adding to it uh, just to kind of give a unique profile. And I should have totally clicked on myself because I can't see what I'm showing, but I don't know if that shows up or not. Oh well, I try. It's about the effort. My mom said it was. <laughs> we saw it. All right. Uh, the shadow box video is what he saw yesterday and made him sub. The firefighter box uh, for his mom was awesome. Yeah, it was for a friend of mine I'd known for a long time, and he's a firefighter, and he, he built it for his mother, right? William said, need a video on a jersey display frame. I've been, it's not going to happen anytime soon on my channel, but it's on my list. 
um, I collect hockey jerseys and for whatever part in the wedding, uh, my wife, I had a, uh, an old LA Kings hockey Jersey. It was black and white and it, and it, cause I was wearing a tuxedo and then it, on the front it said groom and my wife had a custom made Jersey that was the yellow of the bridesmaids and it said bride. And then the year was like the month and the date for our numbers on the back. And it said bride and groom on the back. And so I've been mean, we've been married over 10 years. And I still haven't built that one. So. <laughs> you better get on that. Yeah. What am I going to do at ski? It took next year. So is, is that's the one in Oklahoma. Is that correct? That was new this year. Yeah, that was uh, um, Ted and I put up, put that on this year. Oh, I did. I didn't even know you did that. Yeah, that was while well, it was. It, Ted lives in Sky. I took, oh. and and he was like, "Hey, was, or anyway." Long story short, for anyone that is you know, like just joining or doesn't know the backstory, my friend Ted Alexander, who's all, also got a YouTube channel. If you check him out, Ted C Alexander, in 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 the search. Um, he lives in Skyatook and he was like, Hey, he just got a wood miser bandsaw mill. Now, granted, this is already like a year and a half or so ago or more. Uh, he goes, Hey, why don't you come down to my house and we'll spend a long weekend milling up some boards. And then we started inviting people and inviting people and inviting people. And it literally went to, well, man, we'll just invite. And we must've had four or 500 people come out for the weekend. And it was an absolute awesome time. Um, you guys can check out video woodworkers.com. If you sign up for that that email newsletter on there, um, that's a website that I that I have. Um, I don't know if if we'll keep that going or not. I haven't talked to Ted in quite some time. It was it was fun. It wasn't ever planned to be um, a, a, an additional thing. And in fact, let me see if it'll let me put the link to that in the outside chat here. But um, maybe it yeah maybe it let me just now, but. I don't know. It was fun. The property was gorgeous. Everything, everything was just awesome. With so many, okay, so I started planning a couple of these events to get people in the community together, and I understand that, that other people want to plan their events. I, I just was planning the events to try and get the community together. There's a million, I shouldn't say a million, there's several other people planning their events to get the, I'm not looking at competing. I just figured it was good to get people together. If other people are heading it up and getting people together, that's great. I'll bow out. I got no problem with that. But um, Nick, you all better do it again next year or else. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It really was. Um, it, it, certain things would have to be changed. Now, okay, real quick. I apologize, James, but real quick. These events of getting together are really nice. Sky took centrally located in the U.S., Beautiful property, plenty of power. The problem is when you don't move the events around, if you have something in southern Florida, that's great for that area. But somebody from Portland's not going to come. If you have something in Portland, somebody from southern Florida is not going to come. So I like the idea of moving it around, and that affords people the opportunity to kind of go, more people, you know. But then you're like, well, I got to find a property and stuff, and that's that's real difficult. But anyways, yeah, if you go to videowoodworkers.com and sign up for that, that's where I announce that type of stuff. Well, cool. Hopefully that goes on. If it goes on, I'll go and build something awesome. It was pretty crazy. Uh, uh, Braxton brought his. He's got the same lathe as mine. They're about 550 pounds. He brought his lathe. Uh, Artisan Dice brought – like three or four milling machines and damn near a semi trailer. Uh, Kelly Palmer brought his big sawmill. Um, Ted Alexander, his big wood miser sawmill. Um, we had uh, Big Al was doing welding. Um, Jay Bates was there with uh, Stone and Son, Sean Stone. Uh, we had George Von Driska, and uh, he had a bunch of CNCs going. We had Sean Graham was teaching lathe turning his thirty minute bowl class. He was teaching, and and I'm I'm sure I'm forgetting a ton of people, but it was a killer event. I I had a lot of fun. Well, I'll have to bring a a, a portable mallet manufacturing facility. There you go. Awesome. 
I mean, even as simple as Doug Niner from DN Handcrafted, he had one of the busier booths, but he had, you know, a couple band saws and you know, belt sanders and stuff, and he was making wood butter knives. And just people were loving just making butter knives out of wood. And, man, we had a whole kid's station. A gentleman donated pre-assembled birdhouse kits, and those went – and. Just the shipping. This guy went through, created his own instructions, assembled each and every kit, and then taped them together and donated them. Um, just the shipping on that was like 90 bucks. And he, he sent like a dozen kits. Those went within the first day. Kids were – oh, man, I don't know. I'll have to digress out of that one. James will have to <laughs> I'm sorry. I, Jay, this will probably be the last time James invites me on his channel. No, no. We got to have you here so we get we can attract some people. <laughs> so so Nicholas is wondering when he can expect that mallet. I think Barbara's going to fight you for it. Yeah, there she is. Yep. Were you going to give it away in this thing? No. No, no, no. Oh. It, it's basically everybody who enters uh for the next 2 weeks um who who comments and enters, we're basically accumulating names and then we're going to uh give it away. And how do how do you enter? Uh, ba all they have to do is comment on on that video, that video where I said, you know, I sitting thirty thousand subs. Well, you should put the link to that video off in the chat. Ah, I should probably, huh? Yeah, that way all you got to do, you don't even have to watch the video. I mean, it's just James talking about woodwork. You know? Yeah, it's boring. He wouldn't like that. <laughs> yeah, just comment on the video or go to my Facebook page. Comment on my Facebook page or. Uh, uh, follow me on Instagram. That seems to be the new hot thing. Any one of those, and you get an entry. You do all three, you get three entries. We're we're compiling names. We have over a thousand people already, which I was kind of blown away by that. I know it'll taper off. That was it starts out big, but uh, yeah. but yeah, it's pretty amazing. So we're gonna have some tough uh, decisions to make. I, I know Barbara's probably in the running. I'm guessing. Uh, you know, <laughs> oh my my daughters are gonna make me do it fairly. So <laughs> a, a kind of cleaning house thing. You got to give Rupa. Uh, moderator status in the comments. Oh, okay. How do I, I don't know how uh, she's not on uh, in the future. I will. Okay. Cause I was just going to say Rupa's out there. I mean, she could post the link to that video. You're right. And she's having to do the like work around to get a link or an email through the thing. And right. Yeah. It's the three dots. I, I could probably do it actually. Yeah. I'm just not, I'm not, uh, Fast enough, I think. No, I can't. It won't let me. You gotta be the you gotta be the one. You click on the three dots next to her and you can say make moderator. Oh yeah? Okay. Yeah. Did you comment, Rupa? Comment. Comment. Hmm. Comment. She, she's on there. Where? She said uh, add Steve Osborne, James King at fine woodworking whatever dot com. Oh, got it. Okay. Yep. Nick's the resident uh YouTube uh, expert. I am no, 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 I am no expert. I just know what I know, and I try to pass it along. And, and yeah, I mean, my the way I have – I'm on a really small laptop, so the way mine is kind of configured, I didn't even know Steve was there sitting next to you forever. So <laughs> I just made Rian Oliver a, mo a moderator. Nice. I meant to make Jyoti a moderator. So, Rian, you're a moderator now, bud. Oh, you might want to take that away. <laughs> Mod moderate away, buddy. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you got Jyoti in there. Yeah, I made her a moderator. So just make more mallets. Okay, I'll make more mallets, Joe. Here's the deal, guys. If, if uh, I don't know, if I get, uh, get 2,000 entries for this, I will put every mallet on my website for sale for half price for a week. So people who couldn't get one, that maybe perhaps that will make them more affordable uh, for those of you who want one. And that's that's a steal because... That's what it. That's what it cost me to to make it, you know, in wood and and dirt cheap labor. So um, we probably make five six bucks an hour putting them out for that price. I would do it though, uh, well, just for lignum, just for a week, not forever. That lignum can't be cheap. No, it's not. It, this this board costs thirty dollars. This size, thirty bucks. Wow. I'm gonna make sure when we trade for the push stick, then that I get one of those. This is yours right here, buddy. But that, that's too big. I want small. Okay, look. Here's the, here's the sizes. So, so this is the micro, the medium, 
And this is this is the let me put them in together because you know they can look bigger depending on how far they are from the camera, right? So. Oh, I yeah, I didn't know it was relative. Well, well, here I, I'll stand back then, and people are gonna think that I'm skinny. <laughs> I didn't know that's how it works. That's how it works, man. Here they are, right here. So this is my full size mallet. I need the big one. This is the mid size, and this is the micro. If anybody is the win, they all have their uses. We use all of these in the shop. And this is oh, you gotta hold that closer, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> so this, and this is the real this is the real deal. This is that that's the life size uh, Thor's hammer there. Okay, but these three have all have separate uses in the shop. Whoever wins the mallet can choose whichever one you want. I don't care. You can't uh, choose the micro though, because I'm I'm gonna take that one. Okay, yeah, I, I'll make. I'll, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm I'm more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you choose, choose. It's not whoever wins isn't going to be these. These are already already taken for. In fact, this one belongs to uh, Andy Klein. The he funny thing picked it up yet. Um, Steve does stuff. He said it didn't help how many cameras are on you, Nick, because that's the old joke of like, well, the camera adds ten pounds. Oh, okay. How many cameras were on you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! <clears throat> no, when we trade, I'll probably go for a micro because the the last mallet I made uh, for my leather tooling, um, I ended up selling it. So and now I don't even have that mallet. So I I'd still want another. No, I rarely ever talk. <laughs> this, there, does, Brian, three fifty one. Does the skinny guy ever talk? <laughs> No, I mean, I've been talking the whole. Oh. <laughs> he, met, he met the skinny guy on my side. <laughs> Nick, I'm driving to your place. I'll be there in uh, 12 hours or something. <laughs> All right, sounds good. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll leave like a, a sleeping bag out for you because I think it's about 10 degrees outside right now. Ooh, that's cold. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny, the skinny guy. I, yeah, I just, uh, let's see here. Yeah, so Jyoti put the prices up, so I'll probably I'll, I'll do that. I think if we get we get that many people to enter, I'll put them like half price for a week or something. So you guys can, you can if you can afford it, you know you can buy one after the fact, something like that. And th and this go and this goes for anybody, but I mean if if you guys, you know, now granted your odds are going to be better if you don't share this video, but every YouTube channel they they benefit if you find a video, and then I'm not talking just James's or just mine. If you find a YouTube video that you dig, you know, go on whatever Reddit, go on Facebook, whatever it is, and share it. That that really actually helps out people that are making the videos a ton. Um, I was surprised, you know, it, you know, it kind of dictates, you know, what. Oh man, they found that cool. I mean, you, you can tell. I don't know. I'm, it's a weird digression. Un, unmute, James. I did. Yeah, I, I had to put it on mute. So some people were asking, I think it might have been Maya, though. They wanted me to bring over this vice. Uh, you can't see. It doesn't look very big from there, does it? But it's, it's a beast. It's 55 pounds. That's something we made on, our, on, our, uh, on my channel. These are Lignum Vitae, the Jaws, Purple Heart, uh, Paduke. It's dovetailed. This is marble wood. This is East Indian rosewood. So it's uh, – you can buy that, too. I'll put that on my channel if somebody wants it. Nice. <laughs> that is a beast. Yeah, it's it's like fifty five pounds. It's it got Indian rosewood in the middle up here, so it's all solid. It's a big it's a big uh, overweight beast, that's for sure. Uh, it's nice, strong though. It's it's definitely strong. The vice the vice works pretty good. I don't use it a lot, but uh, when I've used it, it's worked great. It's a fun project. I enjoy getting pictures back from people who bought the plans, and and who are making it. It's really it's really cool to see their the the pictures of their vices. William, William, he kind of is backing up what I said. William saying, share it. You'd be surprised how many people that you know that are friends with on these social media that are into woodworking. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. I, I totally agree. Yeah, that's the best way for our channels to grow is if you if you like them, share them. Share it yeah. on your Facebook or wherever, you know, uh, where you let people know about it. It would really help. Yeah, big screen, but he's going to stick with his offer, 60 bucks for the vice. That will cover 20% of the wood at wholesale. <laughs> well, then obviously you're not going to make the whole sale. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Sorry, that was yeah, – I'll just go back to my corner.
I can't believe you're not going to sing in this <laughs> this time. I, I can't believe I sang last time. <laughs> there were so many requests to sing and then super chats to stop singing and then bigger super chats to keep singing. Yeah, that oh, was pretty good. Remember, yeah, yeah, no, I totally remember that. Yeah, I do too. We got rich off of it. <laughs> hey, there you go. Retirement. They're actually, that's a green screen. He's not even in his shop. He's in like Costa Rica right now, Bermuda or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Kevin Miller, there's the Nick I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I, 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 I don't know if I'm, if I'm privy to tell that story. I'm, just, I'm trying to think. All right. I don't, I don't think it's that bad. So I'll, I'll tell it. And, um, but we were, it was Jay. Jay Bates, April Wilkerson, myself, my wife, Kevin Miller, we were all out, out for dinner one night. And Kevin was talking to April, and she just reached out, and, and he was kind of like doing like one of these, like, oh, and then I did this, and I did this. And she just reached out and grabbed his finger. And it was the weirdest thing, and we all had the biggest chuckle. And she goes, I don't know why I did that. And it was the most hilarious thing in the world. I'll, yeah. Just, I'm, I'm done with that story. <laughs> That's a good story. Maybe it was a you had to be there moment, but <laughs> Kevin Miller says fact. <laughs> <laughs> and we, yeah, we just saw everyone stopped eating, and we're like, "Why are you doing that?" And she goes, "I don't know. I don't know why I did that." <laughs> <laughs> she, she's she's a cool girl. Jay's a good guy. Um, it, it was fun. It was one of those cook your own steak places. So it's a, it's a nice place in Green Bay. I don't know. I like going there. Well, cool. But Herod says you did not digress. Why? Why didn't you digress, Nick? My digression has been popular with certain people. Rob is a Rob's a really good dude. Um, I'm hoping that Rob and and, and Dave uh, KSFWG and Kevin Miller all pop in when we do the the after thing. Uh, they're all good people. And and by the and I'm not singling anyone else wants to pop in. It's just I don't know you on a personal level. I know Rob and Dave and and Kevin on a personal level. So so there you go. Well, cool. Does anybody who's out there have any more questions for us? Yeah. I, I might have to use the restroom soon. It is winding down. The viewership is winding down, so I think it's getting late for a lot of folks. But if there are any questions, we'll answer them. And if uh, nothing comes in, maybe we'll try to wrap up in about the next four minutes. At, at 10.45, that's going to be uh, three hours and 45 minutes. Uh-oh, I think I froze. Well, I'm going to make a Welcome to awkward silence. We had a we had a freeze over here. Oh, I was just saying if anybody's got questions, they can throw them in. And oh, what's the link to the video? Ah, uh, I don't know. Let me see. What is the link to the video? Well, you're tuning in now. You have the link that you have the link. It's in your uh, um, address bar. To join the actual room. Oh, to join the actual room. Um, so can uh, Nick, can you post the link, or how do we do that? I, I, I will, but people will join it. Are you cutting off live right now? Oh, uh, no. I, we're going to cut off in, in three minutes, I think, is the deal. Um, All right. Well, let me go to the bathroom quick. Okay, go to the bathroom real quick. Okay. So while Nick is going to the bathroom, we're going to discuss uh, the things that he has in his shop and what we can see. Let's take a close look, close look here. Okay, I'm kidding. It's boring over there. <laughs> The cool stuff is over here. Nick's gonna not, not gonna watch this far later in the video anyway. So, <laughs> but thanks, Rian. I, I, I hope that's how you pronounce your name. Thanks for tuning in and chatting with us. We really enjoyed it. Uh, Chris Shannon bought a cordless drill cabinet. Send pics when you complete it. Yes, please do send pics. We uh, we would love to see those. I like to see those. Hope Nick turn, turns off his mic. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, Dave, you're heading to bed. I thought you were going to hang out for the chat, but uh, thanks for joining us. That's a 60-gallon air compressor I have in the back. It's made by Husky. It's a very cheap one, but it's worked great uh, for about 10 or 12 months so far. Uh, we like it. 
Next live event. I don't know. I think uh, I'm going to come up with another topic. I've got a lot of topics that I want to talk about. So probably next Friday. Maybe we'll maybe we can plan on a on a regular Friday thing. And Trent, we will try to keep up the great content. Thank you. So I think that's good night, James. What is the cost of that grizzly saw? That grizzly saw was twenty six hundred. Shipping. Oh, shipping. Shipping was two two fifty, I think, two hundred fifty bucks. Uh, the this shop is twenty foot by thirty foot. Um, if you watch the shop tour video, we talk a lot about it and how long it took to make. Uh, in fact, my cousin Stephen here is the one who came and lifted these giant beams and put them uh, up there in the air. They're three hundred pounds, so I couldn't do it. So he had to come put them up there. I uh, lost. Somebody just asked how many square footed. How many square feet is yeah, it? Yeah, by, 20 by 30. And I was mentioning that my cousin, Stephen, he's the one that came over and helped me with building a lot of the, the tough parts. Um, he does that that stuff for a living, and he helped me carry these uh, the huge beams, the micro lamb beams. They weigh almost 300 pounds apiece. There were five of them to carry to the top. It's a ridge beam, so it gives us all open space. So Nicholas used our glue process on a project tonight. That's awesome. What's your glue process? Uh, we just lots of it. Lots of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I basically I, I I glue both sides thoroughly uh, before I, I I join things together and then I pour on an extra quart to be sure. Maybe, maybe James, you can clarify this because I might be under the wrong impression. Sometimes I glue both sides before I join it, but and it, it all depends on whatever I'm doing. But I'm thinking that you know, in doing so, you're breaking the surface tension of the opposing piece because you could have a, a full, you know, glue spread piece here and not here. But there's now you're creating surface tension between the wood and the PVA on one side. But if you break that surface tension by either rolling or brushing, now you're putting glue to glue, and that mates up real fine. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, that, that's the number one reason to do it. If you just get a tiny bit of glue, a super thin layer is fine. But if it's on both sides, you're going to achieve a stronger bond for sure. Um, and also, you know, it's a lot. Of, I see a lot of people, they do some crazy things. They just kind of squirt the glue on and then join the pieces of wood. And when you see those joints break later, you can see what was glued and what wasn't. But if you really want the very best glue joint, you coat the entire surface and you coat both sides. And that way it will, it will adhere. It's possible to just glue one side stick them together and it could still break apart and there'll be gaps on one of them that didn't glue. Oh, there we go. So Nick yeah, has a good roller. Sprayers, you know, and if it's a big lamination, I got this four inch wide one. Uh, I don't use this one nearly as much, hence the still plastic handle. Um, but this one for edge gluing, I use some, I think this is walnut root um, is what I turned for that. But I mean, yeah, I, I like, I like brayers over acid brushes for, Edges and laminations. Acid brushes, to me, I like a lot for tenons and stuff. Yep. Yeah, it is important not to have too much glue. We talked about this earlier. Nick mentioned that, uh, you know, glues aren't good for a lot, a lot of glues, like PVA glues aren't good for gap filling. So if you put too much glue in and you don't use enough clamp force to squeeze that extra out, you're going to have a weaker joint. So you really do have to squeeze all the excess out to get a strong joint. Dean Salmon, hi James, just logged in. About to check further on the hives thing we were looking at. Oh man, we're about to log out, Dean. Jason Ian's best lathe for a beginning turner. What do you, what do you think about that, Nick? Not a good one to ask on that because I saved my money because I knew I wanted to do big turning. I didn't start out with like a, a pen lathe or anything like that. Uh, mine's a, well, I forget what the, I think it's 43 or 47 between centers with a 11 inch swing. But it's a big lathe. I want to know what James and Steven are laughing at. <laughs> uh, just look at Joe's comment of what he does glue. First he coats his fingers and halfway down his arm and the top of both shoes. That, that's his glue process. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, time zones. Dean is over in South Africa. <clears throat> well, I mean, let him know if he's just joining that we're going to open the, the room up in a little bit. Yeah, we're going to open the room up to chat any second now. I think we're about to log out in, in, in under a minute, so we're going to open it up. Nick's going to put a link, and as soon as Nick puts the link, we're going to log out. 
Um, no, no. It, it went, well, it, we're we're ahead um, time wise by about seven seconds. Okay. Uh, when we say goodbye, and then I see the live thing go off, then I'll post the link. Okay. So there'll be up anyway. So there'll be a link that I will comment on, and that way you guys can hop in the room. Hopefully, you have a, a video camera, and in the very least, you'd have to have a microphone. Right. Or else James will regulate that stuff better than Warren G. Yep. What he said. Yeah. You know the guy that's saying regulator? No. Oh, he does. <laughs> <laughs> it's because he has a personality. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm too old, I guess. I don't know. I have no idea. You're wiser. <laughs> All right, Jason. Thank you for tuning in. Okie doke. I think uh, we're going to wrap it up, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I hope we helped you out with some info on some exotic woods. Anybody showing up now, just remember that uh, the, this video is going to be staying on my website. So you can tune in, check out uh, the information that was part of the first hour about these exotic wood species. I have a downloadable information sheet about the various pieces of exotic wood. And that's uh, there's a free download link in my in the description to this video. You can check that out uh, one more time. If anybody wants a sticker, I just got stickers back in stock here. So just send me an address and I'll send you a sticker. And I think that's it. We're gonna say goodbye at this time. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.